eat on camera. Have you ever seen this? Um, it's like the most disgusting thing ever. There's something about the the sound of people eating um, that is very disturbing. I don't know whether you feel this way. Um, I know my uh, wife does. She hates it. The sound of it, yeah. Yeah, I really, it's, really hates it. Yeah, especially if you're not partaking, right? So um, like the rudest call I ever had, a video call, early Zoom days, uh, there was th this person was literally just chowing down on her food. Um, and it was like struggling to talk between mouthfuls and stuff. And it was like, it, like you're disrespecting the food. Never mind disrespecting the person you're speaking to. You know, <laughs> focus on one of those two things. Good Lord. Um, but yeah, she was just like chowing down as if nothing was wrong. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, welcome everybody to Brain Food Live on Air, bringing it to you every Friday. This is the final show of the year. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, uh, for watching uh, the show uh, this year. It's been fantastic uh, to be with you and bringing it uh, bringing these conversations with you every every week um we're going to finish off this week because obviously christmas eve next week uh, and i believe it's new year's eve the week after that so i presume everyone will have better things to do in those two weeks so hence this is the last uh, of the week of the year and we're going to spend this one in a two-hour special to review the major events that have occurred in recruiting this year so have a think about it yourself like what's happened in recruiting this year that you think uh, is a game changer for our industry and something that's going to have persistent kind of uh, uh, interest uh, for us uh, going forward in 2022. Um, okay, so uh, as we kick off, we always do a sound check. So let's just make sure everyone here is okay. Um, I believe people can hear me on Crowdcast, but let me know if you can do. Uh, give me some indication whether the sound quality is okay. Um, we should be live streaming this on LinkedIn um, so if you're watching this on LinkedIn uh, for the final time this year, uh, let me know whether you can hear the audio okay. Uh, give me a yes, no, maybe on that. Um, and we should be, uh, or we're going to be live on Facebook now because I forgot to press the damn button. Um, but now I've pressed it. Hopefully we're going to be live there as well. Um, I need someone to do this. It's like literally too, it's too confusing on the backside of it, isn't it? It's like, how do you make this work? Anyway, I think we're all good. Uh, so we are we're broadcasting on all these channels and audio is fine. Um, okay, um, a quick word to our sponsors this week. Uh, we are talking about our friends at Platypus. Um, firstly, I love the name of this company um, because, you know, who doesn't love a platypus? Um, and they are doing something uh, really quite interesting. Um, because they're trying to create a product which allows you to understand team fit. So in other words, rather than recruiting individuals as if they were completely interchangeable units, uh, they're thinking, okay, what is the team in which this person is going to go into? Because you need to know that because that will determine what kind of person is the right person for that group of people. Um, and if you're a sports fan, and Adam, I know you are, you'll be very familiar with this, where a star player from Team B gets transferred to your team, and guess what? Suddenly he's terrible. Why? It's not because he's a terrible player. It's because he he, he, he doesn't fit in some in some way to how you operate as, as a group. Hazard. Um, Eden Hazard at, at Real Madrid. Great example. What a wonderful player he was in the Premier League. I think if you picked any first team 11 in the history of the Premier League, Hazard would be playing number 10, and yet he's come into Real Madrid, got injured a couple of times, not really contributing to the club. Now he's talking about, oh, transferring to somewhere else, like a Newcastle or something, and I'm thinking, I'll be embarrassed if someone like Newcastle gets him. He's way too good for us. Um, but it's like he does need to go elsewhere, right? Um, because his fit isn't there. Coutinho for Barcelona, another example. Um, a wonderful player for Liverpool, um, he went to Barcelona. He's been on loan three times already. His career is kind of in standstill. So uh, Platypus do this. Do check them out. I've just uh, sent uh, their link in the uh, stream there. Uh, Nico, our friend uh, and CEO of the business, will be joining us as well. Give his his verdict on where technology is going in 2022. Um, anyway, uh, we're here for the last time to share, Adam. Um, it's been emotional, man. Thank you so much, by the way. I know I give you crap online, but thank you so much for being there more or less every week and being available to, to be interlocutor. It's been great having you. And, uh, you know, you, you do have like 
one or two people who are fans of you. Who, who what can I say? I mean, not many. I bring one or two extra people to the show, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Each, yeah, each year. That's right. It's like it, 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 there's like fans of Adam and uh, and, and Nemesis. Is like the people that actually yeah don't like this guy. Others, others think yeah he's great. Um, so anyway, I appreciate you being here, and it's great to have you on. So anyway, um, thank you. So, um, what's happening with you guys? Are you, are you shutting down for the year already? It seems that the industry's already done that. I don't know whether you get the sense, but I'm not like getting any emails, getting any activity. Are we done for the year, or have you got another week's worth of sprinting to go? I hate to admit it, but I think we are pretty much done for the year. Um, like in terms of, let's call it trading. However, <clears throat> I've got quite a few special initiatives. I think let's call them happening. So I'm not entirely sure. Uh, how uh, much downtime I'm going to get. Although I've got about two weeks technically off work. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe that'll turn into like three days. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think you're, you're similar to me. There's always stuff to do um, that you think is, is plus one. And I'm actually looking forward to doing some of these plus ones that I find operationally difficult to do during the week because there's so many things happening already. It's like major projects that just d delay, both personal and professional. Um, uh, so I'm hoping that after today, I'm going to have a decent sprint at it. Obviously, the newsletters are still going to go out. So, you know, don't worry about that. That's like locked in. Uh, that's like our, our Armageddon proof. You know, the, the world will explode and Brain Food still out on Sunday. No worries. So that's happening. Um, but without Brain Food Live, which actually takes up a chunk of time, I hope people, do, people probably don't realize this, but booking the guests and stuff like this takes a huge amount of time. Um, that's going to save me a couple of days and that will help me uh, do some uh, project work, which needs to be done. So, um, so yeah, it'll be good. Um, all right, let's get on with the show. Um, in terms of your review of the year, Adam, um, uh, going from your perspective of, you know, let's talk about what you do. You basically sell, I know you don't like to call it CRM software, but it's like messaging automation. It's candidate nurture type stuff. Where is that market? in this in 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 the uh, the year of 2021 like where do you see the progress the adoption um uh, you know how how does it look for 2022 um so uh, before i answer that question are we doing the, are we talking about the brain food or not oh crap i keep forgetting that um yeah <laughs> Shall we talk about brain food? I, I love that. Food. I love that question, but I'd, I'd really love to quickly right. talk about the brain food. Let's give five that. minutes to what happened last week because it was actually a very right. good issue, wasn't it? It really um. was. It really was. <laughs> there's, there's there's three or four we can batter through really quickly. All right, go so on. Then. The first one is the Dutch pizza company that's trying to raise, trying to hire 500 more people. So yeah. let's talk about compensation and benefits for a second. One of their benefits is they're trying to be the first company um, to deliver pizza in space. <laughs> and uh, they they are offering people the opportunity to join their company if they want to have the chance of delivering a pizza to space. What I'm not even sure you can you can't even you can't even get pizza to space. Surely you got to no, have to I, put I, it in. I, I, I think Special you'd be banned. Marketing. Yeah, you'd be banned. But I mean, what a great stunt, right? I mean, I think it's one of these to say, um, if people don't know where this, uh, a, a, an Amsterdam pizza delivery business called New York Pizza, apparently good good pizzas, according to Bass, who, who's had one. Um, but uh, their, their recruitment tactic is to say, mm -hmm. yo, uh, apply for the job of a pizza delivery person and you get entered into a raffle uh, whereupon you get, you know, one of these people are going to be sent into space in 2023 when the commercial cost of sending, uh, we're already getting like civilians up there because people are prepared to pay. So it's going to cost a couple of hundred grand maybe to send someone up by that time. Um, in which case, um, it's like, okay, here's the hook. Um, whether they ever do it or not, who knows, but great PR, great marketing, right? I mean, just Pulling stunts is just generally great marketing because you, you often don't even have to fulfill. I mean, we now know there's a place called New York Pizza in Amsterdam. So, yep. Um, <clears throat> the second one uh, that I wanted to quickly talk about was the firm's um, annual membership survey. It's a yep. must read piece of content. Um, I read it every year. And this year, the so the thing that I go to first is always the list of priorities for talent acquisition leaders. What is the most important thing for their agenda in the coming year? And there's been no real change this year compared to last year in terms of the results, but um, I'll just list them. So the <clears throat> diversity and inclusion is top with 50% of people saying it's a big priority. Candidate experience is second. EVP and employer branding is third. 
Recruitment and succession planning is fourth, um, and uh, direct sourcing is fifth. At the very bottom, I was I smiled and raised an eyebrow at the one at the very bottom, which was GDPR compliance. That was that was the least important priority for. Uh, so there can't have been many banks uh, getting involved in the survey. But anyway, um, interesting it, stuff. Would that be would that be because we're already compliant though? Um, I would expect. I would expect so. Yeah. Like, are we all now GDPR compliant? I think we probably are, aren't we? Um, although, then again, I think a lot of us are kind of just waiting for the for someone to complain. Um, and then have to deal with it. So it's not clear how compliant we are unless everyone gets that message. Um, you know, if you decided to just message every single business to say, I, you know, we're looking for your policies or whatever, um, then, then that would be different. But it seems that it's receded as a, as a priority concern for a lot of businesses. The last five companies that I've looked at um, who have been talking to me about using our product have asked us about like GDPR compliance and I've looked at their privacy policies and they've got the terms legitimate interest written all over it like 20 times. Um, mm. So there's a million different gray areas and get out of jail, uh, you know, um, clauses in most big companies, GDPR uh, or uh, data, data policies. So mm. I think a lot of companies are just going, well, Calcul life's about calculated risks and it's about it's just a series mm. of decisions isn't it yeah yeah absolutely um what was the top one for the firm again the most it was attrition Div wasn't it diversity no, diversity was it and inclusion yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah which is which is which is fair although i did um on a meeting i had recently with a few um experts i i did ask them if um dni is suffering at all on the basis that they just need to get their jobs filled and there's so many less applicants um, some said no. They have. They've been. At, they, they think it would be a big missed opportunity to take their yeah. uh, attention away from that. And others said the honest truth is yes. We've mm. been told we need to get our jobs filled, um, and you know we will come back to it. But it, it's just we've got too many problems with with empty chair time. Yeah, and also there's there's a third option, which is in fact one of the problems uh, that those two things are linked in the sense that candidate shortage is often due to a very narrow focus on the profile of the candidate that you're you think you need um and they may, may end up coming from populations that, that are of the majority demographic so to speak um so if you're able to open the aperture a little bit as to what it is that you that the per, that you need for the the role in fact you could achieve both those things hiring a more diverse workforce um whilst whilst getting those jobs filled in fact those two things may may work together if you're able to unlock the idea uh, of you know can you train people up uh, uh to be effective rather than you know adhere too tightly as to you know these must haves um that basically constrain the talent pool um yeah okay cool give us a, my, another one my, my my view on that is that almost everything is a talent pipeline challenge um so <laughs> let's talk about uh, kellogg's they uh had a whole bunch of people went on strike uh, yep. two months two full months later of those people not doing their jobs and they said look we're gonna we're gonna hire to replace you and a whole bunch of people took uh, massive umbrage at this and set up some bots to spam their career site and put in a load of fake applications and effectively bring the career site down so um you know it's um modern modern day um modern day in, industrial dispute yep. type stuff Work, worker solidarity this is what it looks like um you know back in our era um not to age just too much adam but it was it was working class people miners striking you know physically striking um and and doing obstructionist stuff and then calling on you know uh, sympathy strikes uh, to occur, which I think that the UK has made illegal. Have, have they? I mean, the, the Brits are, are pretty, pretty much anti-union these days. Under you know, all of the uh, Tory government we've been having over the last uh, several decades or more. Uh, but anyway, uh, this uh, story is about how uh, basically politicised working class representation might look like, uh, which is essentially um, the Kellogg employees struck. Kellogg tried to hire uh, uh, sort of uh, scabs, effectively, is what we would call them. Uh, and what a bunch of developers did is to write a bot to basically uh, automatically um, and massively apply to those jobs and therefore crash the site. Um, and so people couldn't actually apply for those jobs and put Kellogg in this position. And I don't know where Kellogg has been right now, but I, I saw even the president of the United States tweet something that he was dissatisfied by it. So I'm 
pretty certain they're rowing back hard on their previous position. Um, but it, it gives you a little bit of an indication that the previous techniques that you used to use to deal with uh, unionism uh, are not going to be as effective as they were. Um, so there's a pragmatic sort of issue here, um, leaving aside the ethical and moral issue. Pragmatically, uh, the idea that you could just you know, hire in uh, replacement workers, non-unionized workers, could you do that in the same fashion? Well, if you tried, you might run the risk of like um, a lot of uh, sympathy support from other people outside of that group that can do you uh, s- uh, significant damage, you know? So, yep. yeah, very interesting. One more. Go on. Quick one. Um, so you said something along the lines of there's no actual reason why uh, digital beings are less compelling than human beings or something like that. And right. this is about the YouTube channels where there are called them avatars um, who have got millions of followers and are making their creators. It's a creator economy story. They're making their creators millions yep. um, from from YouTube. I I I think that humans are, are a lot more nuanced and complex and therefore interesting than digital beings. But it's really interesting the way that people are just creating new ways of making money and um, good on them for their innovation. Yep, I think that the, um, so this is a really interesting story. I should share the link here. Um, but, you know, we all know YouTubers, right? And they, some of the, the top ones have multi millions of followers, billions even. They make a lot of money and, you know, the, the, the new celebrities of the world. Um, and, uh, but in Japan, apparently some of the biggest YouTubers aren't actually people. Um, uh, they are basically avatars, programmed avatars um, that will, run a youtube channel um and you might think okay this is going too far but i do ask i I do sort of point to okay what is the difference from a a consumer point of view you're still interacting or looking at a screen and you're still looking at something happening on a screen it doesn't really matter whether that is that there's any like a human being behind this um if the thing gets clever enough to interact with you which i presume it, uh, to a certain demographic in Japan, this is happening, um, then the business behind that could basically have an always-on YouTuber making tons of cash. Um, you know, do, doing you, do you believe, through- do you believe people are going to tune in for Recruiting Brain Food Live if the real hung is not on it and I there's a, a robot bot all, hung. i've been a robot all this time adam um uh, has anyone ever seen me in in, in the flesh no um uh, <laughs> this is all projected in no i agree that's different but i'm i'm building a a, a human to human thing here in in this uh, sort of ar side they're not trying to hide it they're not trying to say oh this is a real human being they're just saying hey here's a a, 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 an artificial sort of a, a YouTuber and it's worked. It's got an audience. Um, so, you know, you can imagine, uh, you know, if you were able to animate a popular cartoon character and that cartoon character ended up doing various things that were outside of cartoon character type of normality, you'd probably tune into that. Yeah. Subscribe. Bing. So anyway, um, it's fascinating. Um, I, I, I do think things like avatars will replace like people like news reporters and stuff like this. Um, because you do get this always on experience. It's, you know, you don't have to worry about scandals. You don't have to worry about losing the person. If he or she decides to leave your show or whatever, you've got the permanent asset you can build brand with, um, that isn't vulnerable to all of these other things that might happen to a human being. If you look at, for instance, um, or is it GB news, right? The uh, right wing thing that was set up. Uh, by Andrew Neil and all this, clearly an Andrew Neil vehicle. Um, he obviously left and it collapsed the show and all the rest of it. But that's like a, a risk that you can mitigate in future if you could build similar trust to an avatar. You can control the avatar. It's never going to walk out on you, never going to have a huff or get involved in some sort of situation where they might be fired. Um, and yeah, but it's just, grow- a stu- it's just a stooge for a human, isn't it? It's not a, there's still a human making decisions about what's the avatar going to do? So it's not well, like making its own mind up about things. And you could get it to, But you could get it to say stuff. I mean, does Andrew Neil like, what does he do? He just reads stuff, doesn't he? Um, I mean, he doesn't have to interact to... to uh... No, he's off the cuff though. He's, he, he says, sure. he says sure. what he says in real time, what he thinks and responds in a way. Yeah. I, I, 
I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure digital beings are as compelling as humans, but all right, good good on these people who have built these amazing YouTube channels. All right, and there's actually a th a, a, a middle way option which I'm also a big fan of, which is a, a real human being, um, but pretending to be a digital digital avatar. Um, so uh, there's a few of these online; they're amazing. Um, uh, so there's this one girl uh, who uh, wears a haptic suit, right? Basically, body capture, body cam type, uh, motion capture stuff. She's created an avatar, and she but she live streams as the avatar. Um, uh, but it's definitely her. You can speak I to mean, her. She can do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, Dave's made a good point to say, do we not already have an, like an audio equivalent to that, which is Siri and Alexa and that kind of thing? But I think that, that you got different emotional attachment to Siri and Alexa. They're 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 just there to help you be more productive and get think, right. get your information more right. quickly or do something more quickly. Where you, where you're vi where you're actually watching something. There's a different type of emotional connection, I think, that you're building with that thing or person. That's, I think you're right. Um, but that, like I say, I'm, I, I do believe you can, the, there's some evidence to say you can build an emotional connection with uh, a non-biological being. Um, a, a final thing on this, by the way, um, is the, um, what was I was about to say, I've kind of lost my train of thought on it. Um, it might come back to me, it might not. Um, but anyway, uh, ev everyone's lost if that was the case. Um, right, um, let's get on with the show. Um, Do you time want to pipelining. The yeah, yeah. yeah. Twenty twenty. Yeah. What's it? Has it been like good, bad, ugly? Are people care. Yeah, about this? yeah. I mean, I can tell you, twenty twenty from 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 my business was a bloodbath. It was absolutely horrific um, for about six months. However, from September last year, it's been really great because companies have worked out they need to be more productive and they need to um, get rid of busy work and. Um, they need to reduce the amount of time they're spending on things like cold sourcing and cold, uh, cold outreach, actually, more to the point. So marketing automation um, is something that uh, has got a big place, a, a big part to play within recruitment. Uh, recruitment agencies have probably picked it up a bit faster because they've got internal marketing teams who are doing B2B marketing, and they've worked out a bit quicker that actually – this way of nurturing sales leads and sales prospects applies exactly the same way to nurturing like in-demand talent. So, um, so I mean, think you're, that, also, you're selling now to recruitment agencies uh, on a BD side. So they uh, want to use candidate ID for business development. Not, 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 not re we have a little bit, but not, not, not much. It's not what we're, it's not what we're aiming at. But my, my point in saying that is that they're, they're typically using mainstream sales and marketing products like Pardo and Marketo and Eloqua and Infusionsoft and HubSpot and things like that. Um, we, we've been a lot later um, to adopt technology like this in talent acquisition in the in-house world. Uh, and I think that this time two years ago, it was only 5% of teams that were sophisticated enough to use it. And then by now, December 2021, I think it's maybe 20%, 20 something like that. So it's a you lot, say a lot more. I know you don't like the word CR, talent CRM, but I think it's in that bucket, right? Most, Very different. Most, well, most people outside will still cons could think of it as like communication automation, marketing automation, something like this, right? So would you describe that bucket as 20% adoption um, in the no, current market I would state? No, very, very different. I would describe CRM as anybody can use that. It's just a place to store your information and enable workflows, and it's just folders. Marketing automation is very, very different. So it's a, you know, I don't, I don't want to go in a sales pitch here, but it's, it, it tracks and scores all of your hot leads and enables billions of different marketing workflows. The CRM doesn't know anything about your candidates. So everything in your CRM, you either add it manually or the candidate adds it manually. So right, it's a very, right. a very, very different thing. Right. I think you've got some support there from Glenn, um, who, whose opinion I do respect. Not to say I don't respect your opinion. Um, Glenn, knows, <laughs> Glenn, Glenn knows a lot about it. Yeah. Glenn, yeah, knows, Glenn, Glenn, knows, Glenn knows a lot about, about it. This. All right. So in terms of marketing automation in recruitment, where is that sitting in 2021? Like adoption rate, would you say? Oh, it, we're, adoption rate is probably about 2%. Low, um, yeah. red, readiness could be 20%. Yeah. Very, very yeah. good. Most, so most that's teams, like... Yeah. I don't, just don't have, most teams don't have the... They they don't they probably don't have the right skills in their teams if they're like a team of three sixty degree recruiters it's probably not quite the right model yeah, um, today yeah. and I would say generally it's not the right model today because recruitment is a lot of different things it's not you know the the, the breadth of a three sixty degree recruiter's role is never going to get the best out of that human yeah um, so in, in in my opinion and I think in a lot of people's opinion so 
uh, yeah, adoption, maybe 2%, uh, readiness, maybe 20%. Yeah, that's really interesting. And by the way, these are positive numbers because it means the market is just massive. Um, and, you know, you just got to tip it over before it becomes a mandatory thing. Um, and uh, and you're right. I think the idea of I can't think of a worse thing to do as a recruiter other than to be the person that has to nurture, like manually nurture candidates in a high demand market. How are you going to do that? I, I'm not even well, sure that it's even possible to do. Dun, um, Dunbar's lo- Dunbar's number is 150. Uh, yeah, so you can only maintain you can only maintain relationships with 150 people and remember something about them. Yeah. So if you've got a talent pipeline with you know 5,000 people in it, it's a non-starter. You can't do that. You know, ma- you can't do that um, manually as a human. Your brain your brain doesn't remember all those people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually can do like uh, a t- a 250 um, uh, because I've trained myself as a recruiter to do that. But I've paid the price because other parts of my memory are completely defunct. Um, like there's tons of stuff I simply don't have any visual memory on at all. But I'm quite good at remembering names and faces and stuff like this. I think I've tuned my mind to do this. Um, but I'm, I'm sure paid, you paid the price. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Uh, recruiters probably are a lot better than the average average person because their job is to remember, you know, people. But when you're relying on in recruitment, when you're relying on people, you know, Pfizer's got 10 million people in their applicant tracking system. It's quite difficult to know anything about these people. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally get it. I mean, you, you can't scale to that level. You need like a second brain. For sure you do, for sure. Um, okay, let's move on. We're going to bring on some of our guests. I forget the order that we're going to have this on. Um, but I tell you what, I'm going to try and bring Wolfgang and Louise on. Wolfgang pr- primarily because he's joining us from Germany, obviously. Um, and, you know, it's already 2.30 over there. So maybe he uh, he needs to like, uh, you know, take the weekend already. Um, so maybe which- vice, vice beer o'clock, maybe. Well, you know what? I'm actually I'm actually thinking with all these four and a half day weeks start happening, we might have to change the day of Brain Food Live because I, we did it on like Friday the two, 12 o'clock thinking that, you know what, it, people are going to slope off. I think people might not even do Fridays anymore and already be away. So um, anyway, there's Louise. How are you doing, Louise? Good to see you. I'm all right. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Great stuff. And there's Wolfgang. Wolfgang Brickfeder. How are you, sir? Fine, Hang. It's uh, very nice to join you. It's the first time for me, but it's uh, I know Adam and I know Louise, and it's very interesting. I should uh, come more often, I think. Absolutely. I think after this, you'll be back by popular demand, Wolfgang. So <laughs> let's do some quick intros for the people who don't know you. Very quickly, Louise, uh, who are you? What is you do? Uh, run a large recruitment community, know a relatively decent amount about events, recruitment agencies, ta type stuff and i love crowdcast fantastic and yeah you're actually still doing product support for crowdcast aren't you um so amazing stuff okay wolfgang uh uh, for the people who don't know you can you quickly introduce yourself who you are what it is you do yeah it just uh looks like i do similar things than uh, louise uh besides the crowdcast thing and uh combined with the firm stuff uh, i do as well so i look at the firm numbers uh, compared them and uh, I basically I consult companies and uh, how to recruit better themselves. Yeah, I'm well, Wolfgang, good. is GD were you very were you surprised to see GDPR compliance not number one on your list because you're in Germany? Uh, no, uh, it's just a big, it's a much bigger topic. I, I just checked uh, my figures and um, uh, we have diversity on number sixteen or eighteen. So that was the biggest surprise. Mm, Wow. That's really interesting. Diversity is big in the US, big in the UK, but not in Germany. You know what, Wolfgang, I'd love to see the data there. I I don't know whether you have that version publicly, but if you do, I'd love to. um, uh, It would be great to do like a country by country comparison on it because I think you're right. How's your German then? How's your German? (laughs) My my German's uh, good. It's not very good, um, but I could I could pay someone to uh, to translate it. Um, so <laughs> Google <laughs> translate to English. I did a uh, very nice uh, with Marcel uh, van der Meer with an, an uh, active sourcing uh, comparison with uh, German, Germany and the Netherlands, and uh, that was quite uh, uh, enlightening. So um, I can share this with you. This is in English already, and uh, we called it the um, sourcing. Uh, uh, not hackathon, but uh, something, Adlon or uh, Decathlon, Decathlon, because there was 10 
uh, sections in there. So I can send yep. it to you. Fantastic. Pl please do, Wolfgang. Hello. Okay, let's get on with this idea. Uh, 2021 review. Both of you two have, I think, very much of a landscape-wide perspective on things because you're speaking to so many different types of organization and people in recruiting um i think the major difference is purely uh regional the markets that you, you predominantly operate in but i think you're still operating at that like a, a, a landscape level so i want you to have a think and let us know what you think has been the most significant uh thing that has occurred in recruiting in 2021 uh, as far as you're concerned, um, any any thoughts on 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 this? Uh, go to you first, uh, Louise. Um, I thought we were talking about events, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the. If that's okay. What are you talking about events? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I can't really concentrate because I had that really painful booster in my arm yesterday, so I'm struggling a little bit. Um, oh. Got my sad face. Um, so. I was going to talk about events because I think it is interesting that um, I've had been having conversations with vendors and with TA and recruiters about what they're thinking they're going to be doing next year. Um, I'm involved in the Agency Expo, which is obviously agencies, and a number of people have said to me, oh, is that still happening in February? And I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, we're back there again of that uncertainty of um, whether events are going to happen. And it's very challenging for vendors because um, we talk a lot about um, TA people and, rec and recruiters, People like Adam have to get in front of those people. And one of the way mechanisms for doing that is events. And when there's all this uncertainty about whether events are happening, people aren't committing to attending either as a vendor or as a recruiter. And I was actually going to ask Adam whether you've committed to sponsoring any events next year and being at them. Uh, virtually none. So it's a great question. And we have committed to... Uh, sponsoring a couple of podcasts and other like digital programs. The only thing that we've committed to, which has an online, an offline aspect to it, is I think Un Unleash, which will be in Paris or Amsterdam, but that's like October. But to be honest, chance of that happening? Who knows? I don't know. It's so far off that. It's easy for us to say we'll do it, and then we'll see if it, it does happen. And then the, the other one is is RL100, which is uh, again mostly an online um, uh, you know initiative. But there are four, I think, offline uh, you know events gatherings. Um, I think the first one, which is happening in March, I don't know. I've, I, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen. We'll see. You know what? That's very interesting. How is it looking events-wise on your side, Wolfgang? I know you're massively into the events business in 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 Germany and the DAC market. So, what is the attitude there? Um, yeah, and this year um, I started out with the first uh, uh, recruiting trends 2021 um, session that was uh, uh, online, and we had like in the, the first one, and we had out uh, uh, from start of now we had 1,800 people attending. And uh, but it was quite big, and we had some smaller ones in the, during the year. But and we had the first live uh, fair, um, recruiting fair, the, the biggest one in in, in Europe. Uh, it's but right? it's a smaller event, um, smaller sized event this year. But the first live event, we were so happy to see each other again. Um, and it was like when we had like in a, in a session, we had like uh, three to four hundred people usually in a pre-pandemic area. Our time um, we had now it was fully booked, but it was like eighty or hundred people, with mm -hmm. uh, sizes between the, the seats and this kind of stuff. And but it was uh, fully booked, was only hundred people. It was uh, strange, but it was good to see each other again. Uh, but it was the first and only. Uh, it was a big, um, uh, yeah, big risk for the providers, but uh, yeah, it was uh, at least we had something. And then we went back, of course. I would call the the year again the roller coaster year um, for uh, you yeah, know for everybody. Recording so, at, uh, events. It would be fair to say that for the events business or the event side of it, 2021 hasn't necessarily been huge progress. We've seen the first event after a long break, but then we still have this uncertainty about if, whether if we're say, back to. Say, uh, no, no. If you say events, if you say live events, yes. Online events, no. Online events have uh, have a big had have had a big year. So what's possible has been done online, and was only one, as I said, or two. Uh, live events. So live events, no. Uh, online events, yes. 
Yeah, and I think live events might actually get smaller, more frequent maybe, as Adam mentioned, because they're safer to run, right? Because if you cancel it, the risk is going to be less. If it's a 100-person event, okay, it's not great. But it, compare that to a 1,000-person event, the scale and cost, the risk for you as an organizer is more than 10 times. It's like yeah, the, significantly. The live bigger. event uh, was usually uh, visited by around 20,000 people. And this year was around five or 6,000. So um, yeah. that's a big risk. <laughs> But for a vendor or an event organizer, there's a massive challenge in that because, you know, Adam's being encouraged to come to an event and sponsor it. He doesn't want to have 60 people in the room because there's other ways that you can interact with 60 people. Um, and maybe you do, Adam, but lots of vendors don't only want 60 people in a the room. They want to do that expo size type event where they can have an awful lot of foot traffic. And I definitely have seen that in the, maybe the TA space is slightly more sophisticated, but in the agency space, these CRMs um, and multi-posters, they want a hell of a lot of footfall in order to snag those delegates and have a conversation with them. I think it definitely depends on a couple of factors. And one of them is when you're talking about CRMs and multi-posters, that's a very, very competitive market. So the ability, and it's quite a saturated market. It's quite a mature market as well. When you're, when you're thinking about the types of technologies that might turn up at the startup stream at Unleash, for example, you know they want FaceTime with the, the 5% most sophisticated, not a numbers game. So you know it's, it, it's, um, there's lots of different tactics, but um, I, 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 can, I can see why those types of businesses, if I'm a bullhorn or something, it's a numbers game for me. Yeah. It's, yeah, all, it's like always been sold on numbers, though. That's, you would like to have more people. If you like to have more awareness and this is then uh, your your uh, funnel then you would like to have more people if you're more into deep diving then of course you like to have uh, uh, 30 people who can really uh, work uh, with you yeah you know what I'd, I'd like to just address the audience momentarily on this like what is your attitude to online events like everyone's hungry for uh, sorry in-person events um would you like commit to go to one of these or do you think that actually maybe it's gone away as an idea um i mean let me know in comments let me know whether you think 2022 you're gonna kind of feel yeah i'm back doing this um and it's gonna be great to do i'm definitely keen to do it i mean everyone everyone's like i think want to um but it almost needs you gotta uh, everyone's gotta commit together like the delegates the vendors and the event organizers have almost got to talk to each other to get that sense of trying to de-risk because uh, the risk is each other right um uh, all of us don't feel um comfortable with uh, another part of the, that three doesn't work the big consideration is is 2021 the new normal or is 2021 50 percent of the new normal or is 2021 mm -hmm. just a completely it's not going to be like this ever again i've been on one set like return flight this year for work uh and i went to i went to true london the first day and I went to an RL100 um, like gathering for, for two days after that. So it was two events in a like a three-day trip. That's it. And I have I've grown my business quite a lot without going anywhere or seeing anybody in person. Yeah, that's very interesting. And Helen's made, made a very good point. People want to do it, but there's still this risk factor. It's part of the reason why I think Wreckfest has got it right. I mean, the, the, in terms of their outdoor commitment. Um, uh, so they've always decided to do the event outdoor um and obviously it, as a british organization in britain that's like a, a, already its own high risk um however um they've got away with it to date um and again i think they're going to do a big one i think in Nebula or something i can't remember it's gonna be a huge type of event um uh, three five thousand people something like this but if it's outdoor on a festival i think people feel safer right because it's about ventilation we know now um and uh, they don't be locked into a hall where you know there's no airflow um so so yeah very very interesting um okay um let's let's put a final word on this uh before we move on to some other guests 2022 uh what do you expect to see happen we're gonna do by the way a prediction show in 2022 um but um from your side louise um what do you reckon uh is gonna happen in you know events and community space in in next year I was really hoping that we'd come to the end of this year and we'd have had less of a roller coaster and we'd have more confidence about what's happening next year. I can almost see us getting to the end of next year and saying, well, that was still quite hard work. 
Um, so that's not a very positive prediction. Um, Neil's mentioned hybrid events, and I think lots of people are going to want to explore that hybrid event idea. But I'm totally with Neil. It's a really, really expensive way to run events if you're going to do it well. So I think that um, is it about events? Is it about being in the room? Content is going to come back as content's always been really important, but that thing that you were going to talk to people about in an event, you're trying to find a different way to get that in front of people. So whether that be an online event, whether that be some other mechanism, that's the conversation I'm having with uh, vendors is how they can get themselves in front of their audience. And they only have one thing, if it's not their physical body, it's their content. Yeah, yeah. Here's a question I'm just thinking about. I, I, I've, I've met all three of you in person offline. If I had not met you offline, would my relationship with you be any different? If I'd only ever met you online, would my relationship be different? I'm not sure it would. Probably I don't not. Think, I don't think it would be any different at all. I've Food. got customers I've never met. Like so quite a lot of our customers I've never met. Yeah. It would take I, you I longer think. to get there, though, because what, it's all about trust. So I think if you met in person and you didn't kill each other, uh, chances are the, the number of connections before you become like solid uh, sort of friends or whatnot is going to be less having had that experience. If it's just online, purely online, it's going to take you more touch points, I think. I, I, I trust you less because I've met you in, in real life, um, to be honest. Th that that can also happen. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that can also happen. Um, um, do you recall our meeting in Munich? Yeah, we had Weinscholler. Yeah. How can I how can how can I forget this? <laughs> that was the that was the, the the initial meeting that we started out our uh, uh, cooperation. And uh, I think uh, if we had just met online, that wouldn't work out. Do you think Absolutely, so? I think it's also about how you communicate in these different spaces, right? There's some people yeah. that are really good in person. Some people are really bad online, vice versa. So as you say, Adam, you're correct. Some people might be amazing, like digital communicators. You meet them, and you think, oh my good lord didn't expect that person to be like that. Uh, and then that might degrade your relationship and vice versa. There's other people that, you know, uh, are really quite poor online, but then you meet them and you think, you know, why on earth did I have that previous experience of them? So, um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to uh, explore and see which, uh, which channel um, is going to be best for relationship building. Um, okay. Um, let's uh, let's move on real quick. Um, we're going to say goodbye to Louise and, and uh, Wolfgang at this point because we're going to do roll on, roll off with the guests. So, uh, Louise, please hang around in the chat if you're free. Uh, but great to see you. We'll speak again soon. Um, a great, by the way, background, etc. Uh, and Wolfgang, great to see you as well. Hopefully, we'll catch up in person soon as well. You have a very good uh, Christmas and uh, New Year, sir. Uh, we'll definitely you have you back well. on uh, a brief few live. Bye. Good evening. What a great dude. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> Wolfgang, he's funny. He's interesting because I did meet him for, for, for a drink way back when. But I think it needed that meeting for us to have a good relationship. Um, because, uh, as I say, I think um, Wolfgang and I probably have different communication styles digitally. Um, and it wasn't always that clear um, you know, via text, whether, you know, we would have a very strong relationship. But, you know, since I met the dude, it was like, yeah, totally cool. So, yeah, these things are up. Well, I mean, I think is, is Stephen Rothberg coming on hey, we screen? Can, we can definitely bring him on. I mean, um, yeah, no, I, was, I wasn't sure if he was in the lineup. I can't remember. I, I'm pretty certain that Stephen and I have though. never. I'm pretty certain that Stephen and I have never met in person. But I, I absolutely trust Stephen because I, I like he's he's I've I've been in enough conversations with him, some on video and some like in like social media and things like that. That I know he knows. He, he's a he's a real you know big expert in the, the subjects he knows about. And I, I trust what he says. So yeah. I'm just not sure it would make much difference if it, he and would, I had shaking would, hands in flesh. It, it would definitely deepen the relationship if that happened though, um, uh, because there's another reality to it. I mean, I guess it can go the other way as well, but I think when you do meet someone in person, there's all kinds of nonverbal communication that's exchanged that we don't actually track, but is actually information that our brains process um, and, uh, and it is significant. Um, but we should put that to a test. I mean, let's let's get you and uh, Steve to meet at some point. We'll track the, the quality of your relationship going forward. Who knows? Yeah, um, and actually, all these people that turn up for Brain Food Live that hate me so much that you keep telling me about every week, um, honestly, in real life, I'm much better. 
Yeah, yeah, he's not that bad. He's not that bad. All right, we're going to go, and actually, uh, uh, someone's going to freak out, but we're actually going to bring on three blokes now. So I do beg your pardon from a diversity point of view. Um, uh, uh, but the reason why we're doing it is because these three are like experts in agency recruiting. Um, and I want to bring them all to talk about agency. Um, so please uh, bear with us. Don't shoot us online if uh, if you're not happy with the diversity distribution. There's actually lots of uh, gender <laughs> diversity in this show. Um, okay, let's uh, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, Colin, uh, good to see you. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you doing? Yeah, how you doing, Hung? You can hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, no problem. Cool, yeah. So Colin Donnery, I'm from FRS in Ireland. So we're, we're a social uh, enterprise cooperative. Um, we have eight businesses, so two sort of sides to it. One is in the recruitment, uh, large agency recruitment, uh, large employability business, so getting unemployed people back to work. Um, business process outsourcing. That's one side. Then the other side is agriculture. So uh, we provide agricultural services into uh, lots of farms in Ireland. And uh, we've the fastest growing tech, agri-tech app in the world currently um, in our stable. So yeah, really diverse. You wanted diversity. That's a diverse business for you. Diverse business and uh, great to have you on the show, Colin. A uh, long time that that's happened. So we'll have to do a better job next year, 2022. Okay, uh, Neil, good to see you. Uh, quickly introduce yourself. Who are you? What is you do? Hi, mate. Um, I presume a comment with diversity is about the fact you've now got 75% Celtic uh, <laughs> a, a panel on you. Uh, Neil Carberry, Chief Executive of the REC. <laughs> and I just um, I, I, just before we get in, an important point to make, Cole, which he's on a promise to take me to the All-Ireland Senior at, uh, 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 at some point when, we, when I'm allowed to get back to Dublin. You're very welcome. Great. And anyone else that wants to come, we'll bring you me? along, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, that'll be amazing. Yeah. So, Colin, so actually, in, interestingly, we, we we sponsor so the GAA in Ireland, so it's a the largest sporting organization. We have hurling and football, so we're their main sponsor for their worldwide app. So, so to try and attract people, it's it's a recruitment play, basically attracting people back to uh, to Ireland, and it's just been an, actually to to the, the earlier conversation on pipelining and stuff like that. It's been an interesting way of looking at you know people who have left the country and how you get them back and building that sort of pipeline. And, and we've talked to Adam about this before, and it's really got us sort of thinking about, you know, how sort of programmatic works and, you know, that whole sort of when you get people into that pipeline and how you sort of move them, move them along, you know, so. Yeah, I tell you what, programmatic is something we're going to talk about a bit more in 2022 as well, because I'm still surprised that's not like achieved mandatory adoption. It's still like still pretty niche as a, as a, as a thing that recruiters do. So uh, we need to push that a bit further. But let's focus on what we know from the agency side of the world, folks. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring James Osborne on to join us as well. I think he's struggling to get on. But all three of you basically, I think, commentate a lot online about how the agency and staffing markets are. Uh, so I wanted to tap into your view as to what has the, been the significant moments uh, or the significant moment in the agency world in 2021? Um, and how does that set us up for 2022? Sure, go first, to you, go, Colin. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Neil. Go, I'll first go. go and call you for me. Look, I think if you look globally, there's some big themes. Um, we just dropped our data for tw final data for 2020 this week. Um, and 2020 is the year of the temp. You know, in the UK market temporary worker numbers weren't down particularly on 2019 because, of course, it moved around a bit, but people were keeping the economy going. But perm dropped off a cliff. 2021 has been the year of the perm recovery in a really significant way and pushing right through to... Um, real staff shortages and you know what are the tools to address shortages it's certainly a true story in the uk i think oh, colin will speak for ireland but i think if you look at other major uh, economies similar sort of story in terms of well where are people gone there's a lot of a lot of chat going on about the great resignation in the us in the uk i'm more worried about the great retirement in terms of people taking themselves out we reckon there's about a million fewer people either working or looking for jobs in Britain right now than there was before the um, uh, bef before the the pandemic. That's going to make things super hard. And if you're in an agency, the real opportunity going forward is, well, how do you help your clients find those people? Um, and if you look at something like the the, the data that's coming out, the CBI of the, the uh, uh, of the client side, they don't know how to do it. They're pulling one lever. They're pulling the pay lever. And that, that lever is going to stop working pretty quickly, partially because if you're ramping up pay and temp rates, you're going to have to give something to your existing staff pretty soon. 
and inflation is going to be high through next year pretty much globally so what are the other tools it's exactly what colin was saying earlier about what can we do that helps client businesses find a way through what is a fundamentally more challenging and tighter labor market i think that's certainly true of the uk i think it's pretty true of most of the developed economies as well i don't know Carl, what, what are you saying yeah so look in ireland and uh, interestingly i was looking at the the uk sort of growth figures and overall there's not much growth in the uk ireland's growth this year is 14.5 percent it's off the charts right so we've got an absolutely on fire sort of recruitment market at the moment you know i think it's been 2021 has been i think i think the the, the comeback of the agency really in in ireland particularly um and as you mentioned uh the similar uh, across the world and but i think the big thing is candidates are looking for different things obviously with inflation running you know really start a high so salaries need to keep up with that but salary definitely isn't the number one priority for candidates at the moment they're looking for more than that flexibility you know is probably the number one thing people who work in offices are coming to us for um and i think we're going to have this great divide really between those sort of people effectively who work in offices and people who don't do you know and, and how do you give flexibility to people working in factories or you know in in different environments like that that is going to be the key challenge from an attraction perspective as we as i think as as we move forward um big challenge on the agency side big opportunity for for it's really frustrating from a tech perspective the lack of tech that you know when i look at what happens on the in-house side and you know ta side in terms of great tech and I think it's a making of, of agency, uh, you know, themselves, you know, not investing enough in technology um, that there's not enough basically vendors coming into the market. It's an absolutely massive space, but it's very poor. Like, you know, obviously it's improved a little bit over the years, but really frustrating when you're sitting there looking to add tech, um, you know, to your to your stack in terms of you know finding candidates delivering more that 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 hasn't happened and maybe i maybe i'm you know the only one who thinks that but i do i just think there's huge huge room for improvement on by agencies themselves and more vendors getting into the market you know yeah we've got to get better at buying it haven't we yeah, and that's, that's the thing. it yeah, i think agencies have been very parsimonious historically parsimonious with ev anything that isn't just getting another billing consultant in onto the onto the uh into the stable um so you know many many agencies actually they're very strange companies in some respects because they're 99 of the people are just fee, fee earning people and there's like very slim marketing very slim business support almost zero hr you know, yeah. uh, and I, I, and I think the um, the point. Let me let, let me interrupt you there, Colin, because yeah. we've we've got finally got James on. James, sorry for um for for, for your delay there. Um, but James Osborne, great to see you. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Who you are? What it is you do, sir? Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Um, advisor to the recruitment sector, co-founder of the Recruitment Network, which is a community of agency recruitment businesses around the world. Um, I think th th this is a really fascinating conversations. These and, I, and I've been, I've had so many conversations over the last six months about, you know, are we going to go back to hybrid? Are we going to go this? Are we going to do that? Whatever. What, one of the biggest things for me is the winners in this current marketplace. I think are the ones who are adapting the most to change. And that sounds like a fairly obvious thing to say, but I'm seeing some recruitment companies who are, who look completely different now from what they were two years ago. Now, you talk about businesses, recruitment companies being very headcount focused and less around having a marketing function, HR functions. It's, that's very, very different now. Uh, I'm seeing some amazing organizations who are in really, really embracing technology, who are absolutely f focused on workforce capacity as much as anything else and efficiency and productivity, um, as if they're running a manufacturing plant or, or something else, description like that. Um, and I think it's really, really exciting. And I think the ones who have gone on with it this year are the ones who are really winning this year from an agency point of view. And I think we'll carry really? on doing so next year as well. Can I That's ask great. a quick question? Great to hear. Really great to hear. A, a quick question mm. on agency attitude to remote working for their own staff. Because mm -hmm. this year, one of the big stories was that recruitment agent owner who came out and said, look, um, a lot of the work from home crowd are just lazy. Uh, we want them into the, you know, remember that? <laughs> that blew up everywhere. I think he was like, 
he was, he was probably doing a bit of marketing for his for his business, but I think it might have backfired because it went so viral. He went on BBC everything. But there is this residual kind of perception that agencies are very office centric. You know, everyone understands the busy sales floor and so on. That we uh, that kind of group of of companies maybe uh, the most conservative when it comes to flexible working. What do you see about that? Do you think that's true, or do you think there's companies that have, have kind of embraced the idea we should be more flexible? James, let's go with you on this, given your kind of interaction with the network of agencies there. Yeah, hundred percent. The, the the agency world is definitely embracing more flexible working of some description. Where it goes wrong is when people start saying, "Okay, we we now need to be fully remote, or we need to be fully back in the office." It doesn't work like that. There are components of a recruitment a recruiter's job that you cannot do on your own. You need people around you, coaching, support, learning, development. That's where all the learning really happens, especially for the younger, junior, graduate people coming into the industry. But for other people who just want to get their heads down and do a whole work on a, a whole load of sourcing campaigns for a couple of days without the distractions in the office, it's bloody brilliant. So as far as I'm concerned, the hybrid model is absolutely spot on and absolutely superb. But you have to adapt it to the people, the, the, where the people are within your business, what their needs are and so on and so forth. But all right, what a, what really a great opportunity, though. Real talk, James, on your community of recruitment agencies, how can you give us the uh, a percentage split in terms of the ones that have gone fully remote, the ones that have gone fully back in the office, and the ones that have gone the hybrid mom? Yeah, off the top of my head, I would say about 2% have gone fully remote. Wow. I, would, I would say about 10% have gone fully back into the office, and the rest have gone for some form of hybrid solution. Can right. I ask a follow-up question to that, which is when you say hybrid, is, does that mean that they're saying to their people, Right. Every Monday and Wednesday, that team's got to be in the office and every Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, you can you can work from home. Yeah. So, so, so this is the challenge, right? Because one of the things that is important to a lot of recruitment, any, any business leader is some form of control. Yeah, we're not very good at letting letting go of control. So by having some um, sort of time frames or I won't say restrictions, but sort of protocols around when people are in, who they're in with is really, really important because I want to make sure that those people here who maybe are underperforming slightly come in on a day when I know I've got the people who are performing well and sitting next to them so they can coach them, support them and get them moving out. So you've got to structure it. You can't just be, hey, just come in when you want, have a, have a good time and see what you feel like. There has to be a structure around that. But I, totally get, I totally get that. There's a tech company I know in Manchester who have been losing people faster than they've been hiring them specifically because they've told everybody you need to be in these two days a week for this team, these two days a week for that team or whatever. And they're considering it's just the worth of worst, worst of both worlds. Yeah. They can't no, go into the office whenever they want and they can't work from home whenever they want. No, that's okay, though, because what will happen is the market will equalize between companies that actually do a Monday to, to Thursday kind of deal. Like, like the, you'll end up having companies that might be labeled that way. Um, you know, you'll start advertising jobs saying, look, we're running a, a hybrid model, but here are the days you're coming in. Um, you know, midweek, you're out. Um, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, you're in. And then that will attract whoever is compatible with that. So we're going to see like a reshuffling of talent towards companies based on their work operating model. So as so, so long as they stay consistent, I think that's going to be okay. Yeah. The so ones Hong, that we've got, sorry, Hong, we've gone we've gone fully remote, right? So up up till now, so we've a hundred recruiters basically working from home for the last eighteen months, right? Now we've got an academy there. We've fifteen people in the academy at the moment. Actually, James's organization helps us and really good with that. Johnny Campbell helps us as well. And we bring them we bring them into an office. We started them off. They were in the office for for two weeks at the start. We eased them off. And you know, so I I think what we we've, we've sort of done is this We've always had we've had ten offices. We've had people working sort of remotely already. So I think empowerment and autonomy is a big thing in recruitment. And you know this control and command sort of stuff. And this you know we have to see everything that's going on. But that requires great systems. Do you know what I mean? So you've you've actually got to invest in the systems to allow you to manage that sort of remote workforce. And look, our numbers are off the charts in terms of productivity in that in the current environment now. Getting people, look, it is important in recruitment to get people together and you know what I mean? And it's how you do that. But being too prescriptive of this Monday and Tuesday and you come in Friday, I, I, I just don't think that's, that's going to work because what will happen is you will just end up back in the office four days a week, sort of minimum. So yeah, mission, is, mission go, creep. Go, go ahead, Neil. So this is coming up on, we, we talked about tech earlier and taking a long view and bringing people onto your staff. And sorry, Adam, not just believing what the vendors tell you about uh, what their tech will do for you. This is the the people version of it. 
which is you've got to think long term. Our members, I think broadly, James is cut. It feels um, it feels right for the REC as well. I think the big challenge to recruitment in the recruitment industry is the fundamental changes of behaviour that this way of working and in fact the kind of client care that this more complex labor market Heidi I think was suggesting in the chat those two things require a fundamental approach for, uh, change from first and second line managers in recruitment and supporting our managers to mm. manage in new and different ways and not just rest on power and control yeah. that feels to me really really difficult but fundamentally the right fight to pick yeah, Neil, I think to look at, and I think I look at that Heidi's comments there, I think it's absolutely bang on the money, right? When I look at it, why would a, like, if I'm a candidate out there, I'm short on time, right? Why am I going to try and apply to 10 employers when, a, when, a, when an agency recruiter, a really good agency recruiter can represent me? But I think that, that's a question one for obviously owner managers, you know people running agencies but also for the industry i don't think we've done a great job of actually marketing agencies as an industry to candidates do you know what i mean they don't really understand what we do they you know what i mean and we, we don't really promote it and, and and i'd love to see sort of you know the nrf in ireland and yourselves in the uk with a sort of a campaign worldwide to sort of tell candidates this is what you should expect from an agency this is what they can do for you and you know what i mean why they should so it should apply to an agency through an agency rather than go direct you know and all the advantages around that we're too selfish though aren't we i think at, at the at an individual level we're targeted individually and, and from a company sort of group that's mm. you know who do you do you care about the other other agencies or the condition of the market no you don't uh you know a, 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 i think a, a recruitment agency uh, owner i mean neil and uh, uh james you probably confirm uh, they may love the industry but would they care if 99 percent of the industry went down and their one company was still standing no they wouldn't mm. say, that was amazing so I, I think we struggle to collaborate in this way which again is is the reason why you know a, a, a community such as the ones that you guys have put together are so excellent because that's a rarity still i think the um you know the, the organizations that go and join those businesses are still probably a minority compared to you know the the, the wider market that's out there um okay give us a quick update in IR 30 35 37 39 what it is now i have no clue um r42 this time it's personal it's significant <laughs> but it's one of those things that's kind of got under my radar screen because of all the other crap that's gone on but i think it's really really significant in 2021 what's happened with that and can you give us a quick overview uh go to you jay uh neil, neil with this first so obviously one of the the challenges with r35 which was kicked back for the private sector twice in the in the uk is of course sneaking it in while we're all watching the pandemic um i think there are some significant challenges i think some but not all uh, by no means all of the kind of withdrawal from the labor market of some some folk in the the summer was related to ir35 uh, government's not going to change course but what it could do is it could pass the regulations necessary to make the changes they've already made work so we've got a um big focus on umbrella company regulation next year because where the where the weakness is at the moment is in uh the way umbrella companies are being used to i think drive more uh behavior that legitimately i wouldn't want to see in the industry so the, I, I think I think we'll see big legislative I intervention as the next thing for the British government. But in terms of turning them around on their decision in last April, doesn't look winnable to me. Mm -hmm. Just in Europe, in Europe, Hong, um, you have flagged a, a sort of directive, you know, looking at this whole area around, you know, um, gig work contractors and I, and I think we're going to see a huge amount of change in that in that whole area over the over the next 10 years and I, I think not only for agencies but for employer you know direct employers it, that landscape is going to change dramatically and if people don't keep an eye on it they're going to get themselves in trouble I think in terms of you know retrospective sort of penalties and and all that sort of stuff but it is going to change the landscape dramatically of course in the uk you and boris will probably do what the bloody hell you want anyway so um and the rest of us will get on with actually living in the real world but boris hey, isn't yeah. having a great day today colin is he not no. <laughs> uh, james go to you on this what's what's the verdict um from your network with regards to ir35 like the status of it and how are they responding as uh recruitment businesses 
Yeah, I'll be very honest with you. It's really not a priority at the moment um, for many people. It's not the top of the agenda. You know, all these reports that you're seeing about what's the key priorities right now, AR35 is always in brackets at about number 14. So it's not a priority with everything else. I think most people are on top of it, of how they're managing it with their product suites and their, their solutions that they're providing to their customers. Um, and as Neil said, I think it's, it's one of those things, there's still lots of work to be done and discussions about it. So uh, to be honest with you, I don't even really get involved with many, many IR35 conversations right now because it's just really not coming into the fold where everyone's set up, they know what they're doing and they're just cracking on. Fair play, fair play. I want to move on to a final big topic we might sit down on for a little while. Um, I think the shift to remote um, has fundamentally changed the distinction between an agency supplier and what was traditionally an RPO or an embedded recruiter. Um, because previously, an embedded recruiter would literally be physically embedded into an office, um, but now they can't do that. You wouldn't even want that. Like, would you want a COVID risk coming into your business? How are you looking after your staff in this way? Please do your internal uh, role uh, as us, uh, but from remote. Now, I think that opens the door to lots of agencies providing RPO-like services going forward. Only big distinction, perhaps, is contractual and how you bill uh, the, the customer at the end. Do you think that's the case? Is it already happening 2020-21? What does it look like 2022? Uh, thoughts on this? Um, go to you, James, with this, since you're nodding your head vigorously there. Yeah, yeah I, I love this. I love this about what one of the good things that's coming out of COVID, if we're allowed to talk about all the good things that come out of COVID. Um, it's brilliant. So, you know, if you look at the SME recruitment market, which is the majority of the recruitment market, um, a big chunk of them now are offering a service called RPO Lite, um, which is an embedded solution. They are winning market share left, right and center. It's absolutely brilliant. It's great. It's one of the reasons why so many recruitment businesses are doing so damn well at the moment, because if they have this new annuity revenue, they're closer to their customers, their conversion ratios are going up, they're winning better business, spending less time wastage. It's just a tick, tick, tick box for everybody. And, it, and, it, and sadly, we needed a pandemic to sort of put the light on for a lot of people with this. But, you know, I would say a big chunk of the successes we've had across the TRN network this, this year have come from some form of embedded RPO solution that um, and, some, and there's some businesses. I mean, we're talking micro recruitment companies here are punching well above their weight with the RPO stuff and they're winning it and doing a bloody good job of delivering on it as well. So I think it's great news. I think it's absolutely wonderful. You're on mute, Neil. Sorry, I was answering Adams. Uh, Adams been waiting me up about my national rail map, and I didn't want the click and clack while I was ever <laughs> going the chat. Um, the we get obsessed with the th which three letter acronym it is in this sector, right? The truth is, what's happening is commercial business models for all our clients are changing and they're changing fast. And I think the story in 2022 is going to be that again, right? So you look at inflation, right? It's five percent in the UK. It's going to peak at six percent. The bank thinks in April. That's pretty much a story in most countries. You know, as an inflation wall in the United States, inflation is up in Western Europe. It's up around around the world. Um, we can pull that lever of you know, if you're if you're hiring, of paying a bit more, paying a bit more, paying a bit more. But eventually, you can't pull that lever anymore. You could do some other things, and you've got to think about one: what's the rest of my people offer, and two what do I need my people to do and which sort of people do I want? That is a much more embedded conversation. It goes back to what we were saying earlier about the move away from 360. Uh, it's a much more embedded conversation. And whether it's a kind of MSP model or it's just a, a kind of a, a version of the kind of search client is flowing into, into the wider uh, recruitment market, that is where, as we get into the second half of next year, the real growth is going to be because you look at these inflation numbers, you look at corporate cash positions globally, you look at where we are now with Omicron, companies will have to restructure in the second half of 2022. Mm -hmm. And that will have big people in place. And the, the, I think the next generation of fast growth recruitment firms are going to be the ones who are positioned to help firms think commercially about their people planning. And that is embedded, whether it's an MSP or something else. Yeah. And I think the thing to remember this as well, and what's, what was quite funny is, is that we're seeing so many new models coming out of the woodwork, left, right and centre, whether we call them RP or not, they're all versions of an embedded solution. We, we built one for a few of our members called TTP. Um, and it's, it's one we've won so much really big business off the back of it. And it works incredibly well. What is it? It's a bastardised hybrid blend of a master vendor, RPO, 
and a few other bits added in on the side sort of stuff, you know, but, <laughs> but, but what's happening now is basically we're saying we've got a bit of a blank canvas right now. And if we want to really sort of solve some of these challenges we're facing as organizations, as the way we partner with these organizations as agencies, let's get the blank piece of paper out and let's rebuild a strategy that's going to work for both parties. And that's why it's all about partnerships rather than, I don't see the agencies being suppliers anymore to organizations. I honestly see them in, in a partnership mode. And that's really, really exciting because it just changed the whole relationship. We get so much more done when people treat us as a partner rather than just a supplier. And I think that's massive. Yeah, I, yeah, think... I think... Sorry, Colin, go ahead. No, go on, go on, go on, go on. Go on. Well, I mean, I, I think 2020 and 2021, we, we, even if you take it back four or five years, we, we kind mm. of saw the rise of these like <clears throat> hyper growth RPO businesses um, that have been fantastic for our industry, typically working in high growth tech, um, you know, doing amazing things, the talent falls in this world, Elements, Seed, uh, now Join. Join Talent as well. So all of these companies doing amazingly well. But I wonder whether the golden moment in terms of their dominance has already kind of, was it peaked? But it just means I think 2022, there's going to be a huge charge of companies saying we offer similar. Um, yeah. And it's going to be a massively competitive market going forward. I think there's going to be price competition as well significantly. It's going to be a very interesting marketplace. Good thing for the end employer is that it should mean more choice and more options. And again, I think we're seeing creativity in terms of how you know businesses uh, and uh, uh, agency partners are kind of de-risking the service for customers. Um, uh, it's, it's not just about, hey, pay as a retainer. It's like other ways in which we can reduce. Uh, Colin, think, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I think I, I'm on, I agree with James. I think the, the problem with RPO previously for, for SME recruiters was it was huge barriers to entry risk and costs need to be put in so that that's actually what's been sort of moved out of the way like you know for for a small to medium-sized agency to enter the rpo market you know five years ago it's just a non-runner so what we saw was probably a number of dominant sort of players like in you know low low-ish enough numbers um but that market really has opened up and, and i think employers now are just looking as you say hung at look, we just want the people and, and, and creating that sort of um, supply chain. But the challenge with that supply chain is, you know, a lot of employers aren't set up to deal with lots of different sort of entry points um, in terms of candidates coming in the, in, in the door, you know, um, and those relationships, etc. And that's why RPO sort of originally was so, you know, favored by employers. They didn't have to deal with sort of 10 agencies. But I think that's starting when, to improve. And, and as we see technology improving, you know, um, that allows them to manage that supply chain um, better on, on the employer side, I think the guys are right. We'll we'll see an explosion in in that sort of mini RPO sort of area, you know. Yeah, and I think and to touch on that, and also touch on the, the, the geographical thing that you mentioned before, Hung, is that we've had a number of organisations come to members of, of the recruitment network this year and said, "I need fifty of these, forty of these, whatever they are. Um, I don't care. I don't care where, and I don't care how. I just need the people." Um, and that's really interesting question to pose to an agency. We're basically saying, I don't mind where you find these people, and where you place them, where you put them even, and where they're working. I don't care what the model looks like necessarily about how we're engaging with each other. I just need these people now. It's business critical. That's yeah, really just, fascinating, I think. Just on that, James, I think this is really interesting because we've talked a lot about clients and where clients are. And I think there's a fundamental change in and. Uh, in role of the relationship between TA and house and, and agencies ha happening where they're probably collaborators in talking to the commercial bit of bits of the business. Um, and there's a long road. I mean, just watching Jerry's comment there, there's a long road of development to go here. Uh, um, this kind of shock. Let, we need to float back to the candidates as well. If you just need the people, well, where are the people? I said earlier, there's a million people missing from the British labour market and only about 200,000 of those are kind of potential Brexit levers um one of the things that no client business will have the time and scope to do is the third bit of the triangle so if you think about the triangle what are we buying in what are we hiring perm what are we borrowing what are we hiring agency what are we growing um where are we go there's a big there's a big upside for agencies who can access different pools of candidates who are not getting into the pipeline yet and support them through whether that's kind of the higher trained deploy models that have been common for a while in it they've moved into green tech a bit in the uk recently but they aren't widely used elsewhere whether it's unemployment 
reaching into unemployment, the unemployment space and people who are inactive, or whether it's the whole piece around DNI. And I think diversity and inclusion now has a commercial following wind as well as the kind of right thing to do piece behind it. And agencies have great chance to be sort of centers of excellence for supporting people through the pipelines. There's a lot on the candidate side that flows back to that that uh, client side challenge that James was just talking about. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. Um, and I totally agree with you on, on agencies playing a significant role to help companies diversify their talent pipeline because they may have already specialized or decided to specialize in a certain demographic and be able to be they have access to a talent pool that traditionally has had more friction getting into these jobs. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think this could be a very positive time. Uh, folks, can I just have a quick, to, a quick, uh, quick general, general point about this as well, on. which is that there, there is no better time for service innovation than when you're in a completely disrupted environment and when the balls are all in the air. Oh, There's yeah, no yeah. better time to develop your business and really address what your customers need yeah it's about creating the future adam you know like you can create it you know that's really what this time allows you to sort of do you know all right yeah. let's uh we're gonna we're gonna actually do a forecast show the first uh, uh show next year in january the 7th is going to be what's going to happen in 2022 but why don't you guys give us a spoiler before we we let you go um 2022 with regards to the recruitment agency market space what does that look like um uh, can you give us a, a a thought on this uh so james go first with you uh, 2022 for agencies is going to be an, another record year. It's been a record year in 2021. It'll be a record year. Um, we're forecasting triple digit growth on GP and turnover, a double digit growth on profitability. Um, we're seeing most recruitment organizations are far more profitable now than they were pre-COVID. Um, I don't think they're going to want to lose that. I don't think they're going to go back to that. They're going to embrace that. Um, so, And we're seeing high levels of conversion. So I think 2022 is actually going to be an incredible strong boom year for many many recruitment agencies fantastic has any recruiter gone from in-house to agency that may be a, a a move that you know rare move to make but i wonder whether now might be the time um go to you neil with this uh so slow start to the year as we face up to omicron then right back into really fast growth very much like the uh the autumn so hitting those records that james is talking about through the summer into the second half of the year much tougher uh, if we say that uh, the market overall will grow kind of numbers James is talking about, I think 2020 was a tough year for everyone. 2021 was still a tough year, but we made it, but we did really well. 20, late 2022, that's when the differentiation will start to happen. So um, we're going to see the ones who've got the recipe right really push on through and maintain that growth. There will be some headwinds if you don't. So the tougher economic times in the second half of next year, I think just be ready for. Not so. Yeah. Final word to you, Colin. Yeah, I, I think if COVID had happened 15 years ago, around 2005, it would have literally wiped out an industry for a number of reasons. One, technology. Two, professionalization, which, you know, Neil's organization in the REC in the UK, you know, the likes of the Johnny Campbells of this world has just improved agency so much over the last sort of 15 years. And look, Everyone took a dent in 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 2020, and it was 21 was the big comeback year. Mm. I think we'll probably see real growth till the third quarter of of, of 2022, and there'll be a bit of a leveling out then. Um, probably look in in Ireland, our growth figures are, are fine for next year. Again, we're looking at about seven percent. I, I would be worried about the UK market a little bit just in terms of Brexit and 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 uh, your 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 sort of mad government over there, you know. <laughs> Brexit's done. I, I the, uh, uh, the PM told me. So it's, it's done. Yeah. It's, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oven, oven ready, oh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's oven ready. It's all done. Right, let's let's not uh, dragged into this one. That'll take forever. Okay, guys, listen. Thank you so much for your time. Great to see you all. Um, have a very nice Christmas break. Um, of course, we'll be in touch uh, early next year. Um, we'll keep talking about this. I think it's really quite important we actually get together and do these types of talks uh, and surface up some of these like higher level uh, industry uh, type uh, topics. So, uh, Neil, great to see you. Have a great uh, break, sir. And you, mate. Uh, James, good to see you, sir. Uh, you have a good break. 
Thank you. Can I just very quickly say, Hung, um, the work that you've done this year, I think it's been absolutely bloody superb. I know you've inspired a hell of a lot of people. I'm not just saying that because I'm on your podcast, but um, seriously, kudos to you for the work that you've done this year and keeping the industry going. Thank you so much for your support, mate. Um, you have a good break, uh, uh, James. And you guys, take care. Colin, good to see you and uh, have a good break, sir. Cool, mate. And look, we need to talk about chatbots next time. They're not working. Why are they not working? Right? So, right. I think... Absolutely. We have a chatbot <laughs> show lined up for 2022. Uh, cool. Colin, you have a good day, sir. Look after yourself. See you guys. Bye-bye. Great. Um, okay. We've got to keep rolling on because we've got another 40 minutes, folks. Didn't that surprise you? It's a two-hour show. I hope you've got your coffee ready. I was going to drink coffee, but I've actually gone to the end of my drink and there's some like horrible muck at the bottom of this. Uh, I don't even know what it is. I think it's like, you know, London's got like really hard water and it's like a lot of lime scale. So I think all the lime scale out of my kettle has actually gone into my cup and I had this terrible thing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, disgusting. Anyway, we've got, we're going to bring on Heidi Wassini because um, Heidi's been in the chat. Uh, Dorothy, we're going to bring you on soon. Don't worry about it. But I want to bring on Heidi first because uh, she's, she's been super active. Mm. And I think it's a nice uh, connection with the conversations we'll be having in terms of agencies, RPOs, and all this type of stuff. So let's see uh, the perspective from in-house and how all of that looks. Um, there she is. There, here's Heidi. How are you, Heidi? All good. Thank you very much for bringing me on the show. Pretty excited no about this. Yeah, great to see you and and, and uh, great to see your comments. Uh, you know, love to get your interactions on this. Uh, but qu quickly, some intros, Heidi. For people who don't know you, uh, who are you and uh, what it is you do? I, my name is Heidi Vassini. I work at Vivino currently. I've worked in uh, both small and big companies throughout my career. Started out in actually the business side as a product manager, moved to HR 15 years ago, and absolutely crazy about creating candidate experience and turning the things upside down. Fantastic. Um, and Heidi, uh, let's get straight into it. Um, uh, uh, 2021, what do you see as being the most significant uh, things that have happened in the recruiting industry from a, like an in-house internal perspective? I think um, it has really got to do with navigating in the hybrid environment. You're in the office, you're home, then you're, and if you're international, like we are, um, there are different guidelines, different uh, places, different ways to handle things. Um there is some new guidelines uh, on assessment in uh, the US that's also uh, gotten quite interesting. And then, of course, there's the whole GDPR, which I think is still uh, actually quite an issue um, to to go away from traditional methods of sharing and everything else. So I would say the hybrid environment and then new technology and how to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a big change and, and it will probably walk away from the period. So I think 2020 was more like, okay, we've been forced remote. Everyone's gone remote. <laughs> 2021, we have actually returned to the office. Haven't, haven't we all returned to the office? I mean, we've we've walked in, haven't we? If that office is there. We've actually walked in this year. Um, and then we figured out, oh, this isn't what we expected. And how do we actually persist going forward? And recruiting is something that is obviously a big part and TA, big part of how we how we manage that, uh, particularly as candidate demand is, yeah. is very, very high with flexibility now, isn't it? Um, I mean, if you look at the five factors on why tech people want to move, um, salary is one. And then it's basically transport to work. It's all about the flexibility, getting utilized the skills in the right and work environment, leadership and culture. Those are the factors. And I think those are going to be the factors in 2022 as well. And whether or not you're in part of the office, I mean, that really depends. We have had um, a lot of people who don't feel safe, even though it, the office is open, it's not necessarily that people feel secure going to public transportation, um, going into the office where you're more crammed together because these are open office spaces. That's how we like to work. Um, and then the freedom and the flexibility. I mean, I got twins that are four years old and I suddenly get to see them every day they get home. That That mm. is not happening if I'm working in the office. Yeah. Um, so there That's, are just so many things. Wow. I mean, even for – you make a really good point. Your, your, your boys are, uh, what, three years old? Something four like this? tomorrow. Four, are they? Yeah, oh, four tomorrow. Uh, happy yeah. birthday to the lads. Um, but <laughs> – as a, as, a, as a parent with this experience, right, you were actually in that gap where you kind of understood at one point, actually, I'm going to go to the office, we're going to have to get childcare, you know, you, you, it was understood that's how it was. 
But then we were shoved into remote and suddenly it was a different experience. You had a lot of in-person contact. Of course, that was in some cases, it can be challenging, but for many other cases, it was, oh, I wouldn't miss this for the world. Very difficult to then ask um, your parent to you know, dramatically shift that just because they're a couple of months or another year older, they're still young kids, they're still gonna, you, know, you still might wanna be part of that growing up period. So I think, yeah, very so significant. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking this has got so much to do with another peak pev uh, of mine, which is really a diversity. Because a lot of the time when you talk about there needs to be space for everybody and we need to do all these things, you really don't think about the different ways that, um, for example, a parent needs to uh, work around the day, which hits a lot of female leaderships as well, I believe. And the way that you consider leadership at all um, and career for female uh, people of people or, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> and I think the whole way of turning that upside down and understanding how can you actually utilize that, for example, one thing that I've tried out this year is because I also have San Francisco, which is nine hours um, behind us. So I have a team there and trying to figure out like, how do I balance that? So I do two late days where I work uh, till nine, 10 in the evening, most nights, and then I'm at home the other days. And then when I'm in the office, I actually try to have um, no meetings. So my office time is the socialization, meeting around the coffee, connecting to people. And then when you're home, you're doing the whole Zoom. Oh, I love this. I love this. Um, what do you think of this, folks? You go into the office, but you, you keep your calendar free in order to create opportunity to have those random, more randomized meetings. If I have a completely blocked out calendar and I'm sitting in the office and it's just wall to wall Zoom anyway, what is the point? It has to be completely empty. You have to get used to an empty day in your calendar. Otherwise, there's no point being in the office. Does anyone else do this, folks? I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Is this an innovation you've evolved? Because I think, Heidi, you probably invented this yourself, didn't you? Rather than someone telling you, hey, this is how you do it. Yeah, I, you know me. I'm, I'm, my, my team keeps saying, like, I, I always have one or two more ideas I want to try out. Um, so sometimes I just pilot it myself because you need to be ahead of the team, right? Um, so yeah, this is this is something I just figured out. What can I do to try to balance my work? And I think this brings back to like work-life balance and flexibility. One of the things that we saw at least in Denmark, and I think it was uh, in Europe and the States as well, is that once the corona was kind of over and we opened up things again, um, a lot of companies in Denmark were suddenly like, we're offering you to stay home and work from home two days a week on Monday and Wednesday. And it was like the whole, hey, this is a huge benefit. And I, th the only thing I kept thinking was like, what are you talking about? People work from home for a year and now you're saying it's a benefit to suddenly take away the flexibility to, to do that kind of, um, to do that kind of um, freedom because flexibility and uh, work-life balance is individual for each person and you need to figure out what works for you. I think this is going to be one of the, uh, the key uh, human resource challenges going forward, isn't it? Like there's a lot of companies that I think are going to really struggle to come up with a formula that works. Um, and I do think what's going to happen is we're going to get a, like a diversity of, of, of strategies. You're not going to get, uh, here's a universal thing. You're going to get some companies that will be just, conservative as and say look you're back in the office that's what's happening they'll be prepared to shed uh, and have big attrition and say all right fine that's not for you see you later but the people that are there obviously they're committed to this and then boom they may end up being a reasonably successful business because at least they've gone there and they've made they're not in, in this ambiguous situation um and other companies will make different decisions and they just got to stick to it adam you're about to say it's something gonna be, well it's going to be part of the employer brand battleground really oh, isn't yeah. it yeah. You know, it's going to be an area of comp of high competition. Yeah. The companies that are, I mean, and and also, you know, there are companies there are companies that will almost certainly um, actively choose to be a work from the office company because that'll attract a certain type of person. Yeah, we want young to go people. into a full office. In young particular, people. Yes. young people. Yeah. So when we were talking about recruitment agencies earlier, I was thinking there's a big difference between a company like a Hayes, which you know, hires a lot of graduates and that is, that's typically what it does versus a Michael Page who hires a lot of more experienced people. 
And so, you know, the types of people that they hire are probably going to want different things. They're probably different ages and they've probably got different, you know, prof um, professional and, well, more so personal priorities. So, but I really you know, don't think, uh, like I had to push back a little bit on the age thing. I really don't think that just because uh, the, the generation coming out and the people who are younger, I think they're much more looking into working from anywhere. Like we have company, we have people who just went to Costa Rica and worked from there. And, and the whole idea of working from where you want to work, I think is going to do a whole game changer in talent. Well, there's I a certain age. That. There's a, yeah, yeah, I disagree yeah. with that as well. There's a certain age where you're more likely to have kids and that's going to make a big impact on your you know, personal priorities. So people, I don't know what the age is. It's between 32 and 42 or something like that. I think they're much more likely to value things like working from home. But um, certainly from the companies I, I work with, a, a lot of them have said that it, um, the younger people are, are very much valued, like early career professionals are very much valuing the ability to be in the office, to listen in on meetings, listen in on people's calls and learn through osmosis, which they're not getting. I'm talking about like audit firms, um, the early stage, you know, the, the kind of haze type recruitment businesses, legal firms that do a lot of, you know, uh, 21 to 23 year olds, they hire a lot of people at that kind of intake. But I, I really, I really think it has got more to do with how you build that culture and how you make sure people feel connected to the company than it has to do with location. Because I think a lot of these people coming out, they want to see the world as well. And if you're, you know, if you're a talent that was hired in from, I don't know where, and you can be that even coming out from school, I think, um then why wouldn't you like even we with small kids i'm actually considering why am i working in boring denmark what if i could work from second in greece uh for like three months wouldn't that be a treat and just the whole way of thinking work-life balance and thinking so the social interaction how do you actually keep the company culture when it is a hybrid world because these young people are going to be working with people with other priorities. I think what's going to happen, I mean, I honestly think this, it, we're going to have a gerontocratic system. In other words, it, there's going to be young companies in office um, and people are just going to end up migrating out as you get older. It, it, we're like a college campus um, a type of vibe. So sort of the graduate recruiters, I think the, the companies that recruit graduates at scale today um, have probably already got a good internal pipelining system. Uh, where you know they get fairly raw, raw uh, grads in, and they'll rotate them around, and they'll produce sort of a, a marketing person at some point, or you know an engineer at another point. Um, they, I think, will uh, probably do uh, be fairly committed to office. Uh, but that's another matter. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, sort of something you said in the comments, Heidi. Really interesting uh, about the relationships you had with the RPO and agency supply, um, what's your view as to how agencies, um, or should we say how TA, internal TA, uh, will uh, 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 kind of work with this group of organizations uh, in 2022? I know we're focusing a little bit on, on this year, but let's move it forward uh, uh, somewhat on this. Uh, do you see an increase of usage of these, these services or decrease in usage? I think um, the market for TA is so difficult that people cannot hire the TA personnel that they need and therefore they've been forced into more hybrid RPO agency use. Um, for sure, I mean, if I just look at the example with us, we've grown from zero to five in the, in seven months. Um, so, and we've had to make use of either trying to do the agency or the IPO. Um, and I think it really depends on your business case. And I think what you're seeing in the market is that more and more companies are doing internal sourcing teams. Um, and if they're not doing that, then they're doing the IPO, um, RPO. So I think I think that's that's kind of the direction that we will be seeing more and more. Yeah, very interesting. What about I, HR? I, I agree. Go ahead. I, uh, what say, about... I, I, I agree with that. Uh, what about sort <laughs> of um, HR sort of technology, Heidi? Where, where do you mm -hmm. see... Uh, sort of uh, internal TA spending their money with regards to tooling next year? Money? TA has money? 
I hope so. <laughs> I'm just, I just feel like notoriously TA is the, the place where there's the least budget. It's always been like that. I feel in the 15 years I've been in the industry, um, it usually goes to marketing or it goes to L and D or it goes to other places of HR. Right. So I think you need to kind of team up with, with, uh, other parts of the company and kind of make that business case for it. Um, but I think the budget is definitely going towards more tech. So I, I, I have the idea that if we are as a company to win the talent market, we have to do things differently. So how do we do things differently? How do we actually stand out in an authentic way that doesn't re replicate everybody else? And you mentioned earlier um, about employer branding, and I really believe that that is a way forward. But how do you do that without spending millions of dollars and getting your name out there? And what if what if your product is not known and, and all these things? So you have to be innovative. And I think one of the ways that you can be innovative is thinking the candidate um, experience and putting that upside down. And for that, I think you need tech. Um, because you cannot give an individual experience to thousands of candidates. Yeah. So you need to find the balance between, I like it to call it like the technology with the human touch. So where well, do we need the human? Where do we need the tech? What is the tech that you'd, you'd be looking to spend though? Um, do you have an idea what, what kind of tech tooling that would be the thing you would be buying? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, Nico is going to love me in a second. If he remembers to be on here, Nico, because he was kind of forgetting it. And I was texting him and I was like, Oh, so I'm going to see you online in a minute. He was like, I'm supposed to be there. He, he, <laughs> he, he, he was is. pretending. He was pretending, pretending that he's so busy. He's Oh, what? I'm on brain food. Oh yeah. I forgot. So boring. But... Uh, anyways, uh, platypus for sure. Um, we're, we're doing the whole platypus connect. Um, and this is, this is back to, what I want to do um, and the way we think it is we want to turn it upside down. So how do we turn it upside down? I work with, instead of working with EVP, um, employer value proposition or employee value proposition, I work with CVP, candidate value proposition. What does that mean? We look from the outside in instead of the inside out. We look at every part of our process and we think if this does not bring um, value to the candidate, we need to change it. Obviously we cannot change everything overnight, but this is the mindset that we're installing in the people that we're working with. One of the ways that we're doing this and we're going to be doing this in 2022 is to offer candidates the opportunity to see who we are as a culture because candidates will be looking for the right cultural um, enrichment. That's what I like to call it. I don't like fit, alignment, all these words I don't like. I call it enrichment because I believe you need to have the core of the culture and then you need to make that richer. And that's, that's what, what you need to understand. How do you make it richer? Love that. And then you know that's one that, of the, that, yeah, let, sorry. Let's just sit on that. I think that's a really good, um, uh, the, the language is not just semantics, by the way, uh, the language, even if it is semantics, it actually is important because it frames how we think about that situation. Um, and I love your, uh, uh term, term there, Heidi of enriching the culture. Um, rather than aligning to or fitting into, um, because there's a hierarchy to fitting into somewhere, isn't there? Exactly. I mean, if, yeah. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're, I'm asking you to fit into me, then you know yeah. what? I'm kind of, whole, I, I have the hierarchical advantage over you. Um, and that's not what we want to communicate to candidates. Um, Especially diversity, I, right? So if it's diverse, then how do you talk about alignment and fit? Then there's right. no diversity. Yeah, but Absolutely. Hung, if your if your if your company is a command and control type of organization, you need to communicate that. That has to be exactly. your employer your, your your employer brand needs to needs to convey that. Yeah, no this point is one hundred percent. This is why I don't think you should force or or, or, or harass companies for having a, a clear view. I think you can harass companies for having um, a, a view that's disconnected with reality. Yeah. Um, you know, if they present. <laughs> If they present uh, an image of themselves, because, you know, uh, that is the prevailing cultural winds, they should say, were this, that and the other. But actually, the not that kind of organization, I think that's doing a disservice to candidates because it's almost like false advertising. Um, you're going forward to find for this job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, tell they're telling you yeah. what it is and you turn up and actually it's not what it is. Yeah. That's horrifying. <laughs> Just um, a lie. 
Yeah, it's yeah. it's lying. So you're much better to be honest, and, and and but we shouldn't punish people for being honest in this way. The only way in which we get that transparency is if there's no cost to transparency. Um, because if a company that you don't happen to like um, says that's how they are, and you hammer them for it, guess what? They're going to disguise what they're like, um, and then suddenly uh, that misinformation goes into the marketplace and it damages the candidate and employee experience going forward. Let's just be honest who we are. Let's just say this is the style of business. Is it right for you? If it is, then great, let's go. If not, you know what? There's the lots of other diverse ways in which businesses can operate. There's going to be a great um, sort of opportunity in those places. Mm. That's what we've got to get to. Um, one of the okay. other, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead, uh, Heidi. No, I just wanted to say one of the other texts that I'm looking into right now is actually 10 Guy because they did an online um, solution. <laughs> um, so, so. I wonder whether Jacob's watching this. Uh, he, he's, ten, he's 10 Guy's oh. biggest advocate. <laughs> Oh um, yeah, he loves it. More than I do. Yeah, <laughs> I love but the robot I mean, head. We're do yeah, they they did an online solution, so um, we're testing it out in the team right now because I'm thinking, if you are within tech, and we know that uh, personality fit is one of the highest um, predictors of success, cognitive and uh, personality fit, right? So we need to un understand how what we can offer you and what you're if you're what you're looking for is what we can offer you but we don't want you to do all kinds of stupid tests because you are attract your talent and 50 other people want you right so how can we speed up the process make it more accurate and make it more fun and that is one of the the reasons why we're looking into this and and you know ten guy i think is uh, i've just shared the link there so check it out i'm actually disappointed they got rid of the animatronic head um because i i was very committed to that uh, that thing did they um, oh, that, that's still it, there is it gone it's still there no no it's, no, it's yeah. still there it's gone, for, it's gone from the branding solutions. i mean that was the big triggering thing for jacob was it, it was like <laughs> he, he hated the robot head i thought the head was great um yeah i want to talk like... to the head i want to be interviewed by the robot head i don't want oh you should just a... reach out to ellen Elin. i don't oh, want disembodied do we should write ten Ten guys coming on, the, the robot head is coming on next year. That's definitely <laughs> happening. Not you, Luke. Um, Ten guy. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, want, I want the robot head. Okay, Heidi, listen, we've got to let you go. Um, give us one more thing you think Thank is going to so happen much. in 2022 uh, for internal TA. Uh, that was a tough one. Um, I think that internal TA will be candidate experience and in-house sourcing. I think those two are the, going to be the markers. I think so. I think they're, they're great um, things that hook on, particularly the um, the experience side. It's got to, it's going to be completely the one of the decisive uh, uh, things that's going to change whether you actually get the hiring done or not. Um, Heidi, great to see you. Have a very good Thank Christmas. You so much. Um, we'll see you okay. soon. That's great. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's interesting that, you know, uh, spending cash on uh, tooling that, uh, uh, generally speaking, I think is very innovative. Um, you know, it's not the classic stuff. So, okay, let's bring on Dorothy Dalton. Dorothy, you've been waiting a long time, so I do thank you for your patience. Um, uh, let's see whether um, – I think she's there um, – but yeah, I mean, check out Ten Guy on Bias, man. The um, the head's no longer there. There she is. Hello, Dorothy. Hi. How are Hi. you? Good, excellent. Great. Thank really you for your patience. Dor I wanted to type everything. I agreed with absolutely everything Heidi was saying. I wanted to type away like crazy. I should have brought you on alongside uh, with with uh, with Heidi, but uh, I thought, okay, let's give Dorothy some some proper screen time. Uh, Dorothy, uh, for the people who don't know you, can you quickly introduce yourself? Uh, what it is you do, and uh, uh, who you are, and what it is you do? Well, I'm I'm based in Brussels. Um, I call myself a talent management strategist. It's basically I've I've got a, a headhunting background rather than a recruiting background. I've worked in house um, and and in an agency, and now I have my own business. But I've sort of morphed with my interest in 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 gender balance into supporting organisations make their um, recruitment processes and the pipeline. Um, Initially, it was gender balanced, and now it's more morphed into inclusive and diversified. So um, that's why I was really interested to um, what Heidi was saying and getting 
bent out of shape when you kept saying young people want to do this, old people want to do that. I'm 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 going to be a gender I'm going to be a generationalist on this one. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec because I just want to say, um, Dorothy writes a really really good newsletter. Um, and I I think you should subscribe to it. So Dorothy, I wonder whether you could just grab a link to your newsletter and share it into the chat stream there. Because uh, I think it's, it's. I have to do it now. Can I do it in a minute? Uh, yeah, uh, you could do it whenever you like, but you're going to be talking otherwise. Um, yeah. but the, the reason why I like this is because it's actually original writing. Um, and it is, um, it, it, I think it's, it's got some really, um, non cliched ways of looking at, um, you know, the topics we talk about. I always learn something from your angles on that. So I, I would really, uh, love it if other people understood that this is around and they should check it out. Um, okay. <laughs> Can we just can we just really quickly talk about the the what I was talking about because Dorothy obviously doesn't didn't agree around people of at certain ages will be more likely to appreciate certain things that an employer is offering. I'm not saying everybody's not different, and absolutely I agree everybody's completely different. However, it's surely just a fact that there is people of a certain age bracket who are more likely to have younger kids, for example, and therefore be more likely to have priorities which involve their family than people who are younger than that or older than that so is that not just a fact it's just data I, isn't it I, I, I well think I, I think go ahead if you want to focus on fact and then assumption i mean that the, the fact is is that particularly highly educated women are opting to have fewer and fewer children or no children at all and no relationships so that's that's a moving marker that, that is shifting so that's one thing you have to bear in mind the second thing is and, and having I, I am a mother still but my kids are older I mean honestly being at home with kids is way harder than being in the office so if I if I had the chance to split my time I I personally and maybe people be shocked by this but I would not I would not have wanted to spend all my time at home with my kids so that and, wasn't about a gender there was no gender um, element to what I said there though I wasn't talking about that so no, but, I, it's, but the also it's the same it's the same that not we make assumptions that people want to spend all their time with their families and they don't all the time some of the time no, I can totally understand that. Uh, and actually, there's, there's there's people in my kind of immediate circle that have that sense as well. Um, but I think the, the nature is this is where the um, the type of uh, flexibility, the type of hybrid, so to speak, that you offer um, employees will have a determining factor as to the composition of your workforce. Um, so, for instance, if you said, hey, uh, we're in the office, let's say you make a rule to say that's the case. I'm of the opinion, you know what? I think it's your business. You want to root it that way. That, uh, you go ahead and do that, but it will transform the demographics of your uh, of your business. I think it's going to be very a big deterrent to, to parents of any gender uh, to have that fixed. You know, you're going to be in the office. You're going to have people that perhaps want to disappear. Fair enough. There's a couple of people that want to go into the office and do that. But I think uh, there's a lot of uh, other uh, parents that might want to have some flexibility and not have to think about, okay, childcare, not have to think about uh, who's going to pick do the school run and stuff like this. It's going to be harder for them to make that decision. I think that then skews the demographics to a younger population, typically graduate. They want to get out of the house. They're going to go ahead and do that. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult challenge because you've got to think about it in the context of personas and, and marketing as well. So when you're trying to attract people, you know, there's um, every single individual has got their own wants and needs, of course. But when you're trying to be effective in uh, getting a, a large number of qualified people to apply to your job, then you've got to maybe amplify the things that you expect are going to appeal to them. So there is a fine balance between that and, and, and what you're talking about, Dorothy. And I don't disagree with what you're talking about at all. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier on this. I think I think we, we're sort of stuck in a compromise. I think in an ideal world, what we'd like, we, what we need to do is to shift to the next level, which means that we become project focused almost and, and forget old roles and forget old ways of doing things. And so you hear people talking about four day week or three day week and it has to be, um, it should be just certain tasks need to be done and you leave that person to just 
obviously in collaboration with the, with their team leader to decide when it's done. Yep. So, for, for example, some people, um, there's a big thing in Europe now about not being contacted after five o'clock. In Portugal, it's illegal, Germany, France. Um, but, for example, I would have no problem taking an afternoon off if, if it was a sunny day and going for walk and then work, working in the evening. I mean, the result is, is that I get my work done. But it's that is such a radical mindset shift that people are not are not that far yet. Um, and yet the other thing, and I think you're right, your previous speakers um, said that Heidi definitely did, is, is that running hybrid teams is a really lot of work for the manager. It's really hard work. And um, this is my observation because this is the sort of second recession that I've seen. Um, so in 2008, 2009, um, a lot of leaders were let go. They were fired. And they brought through a whole cohort of, young, of younger younger um, people, employees, that they put into manage management roles, which have had no very little training. And that cohort now are more senior. And they are still without training, and and I and I deal frequently with with, with managers, and they're they're frazzled. They are absolutely frazzled. They they don't they don't know what to do, which way they're headed, and quite often they're getting caught between pushback from the employees for all the reasons you talked about. You know, burnout, needing to you know homeschool, doing all of these things, and then the the um, C suite wanting results. So I think we need, it's almost like a jigsaw. We need to like shake it up and put it out and rearrange it. But I'm not sure we're there yet to do that. Do you think, Dorothy, that that has been one of the, the, the learnings of 2021 where the management tier has been crushed? Um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of focus, obviously, on workers and, you know, their issues. But managers are also workers. They're human beings that work. Um, and but they're, as you say, they're, they're typically in that middle tier, middle managers, pressure from the top, from man from sea level to say, listen, we want productivity like this. Um, and then from the from the people that they, they're managing, they want flexibility. They want to uh, they, they, they want to run their own kind of time. They want to have all of these things. And that manager has has been used to a context where they were in-person managers they were they were you know that group of people that are managing remotely now thought the job was in person um do they have the same skills do you need different skills to be a, a manager of a distributed team i i mean my opinion is they need they they need a di different skills or enhanced skills and you know i call i call the manager the, the cheese and the pandemic sandwich because they, they've got this this push from both both pieces of bread and um it, it it's really difficult and um I, I ran a workshop recently for a big um a european organization with really high number of managers attending and they felt that they were making an effort for their for the people that work for them but the senior leaders weren't making the same effort for them and i think that i think that is reflected in 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 all the research because if you look at all the studies from mckinsey and and gartner and all of these big boxes that they um they all say that lack of recognition being undervalued you know all of these things um contribute to their feelings of, of dissatisfaction so we in europe don't have the the, the big resignation like you do um, maybe in the UK or the States, I, I would say we have the big resignation idea, you know, and certainly what I'm finding and my team are finding is that people are really open to discussion. That's what Wolfgang mentioned, actually. He said something like the big resignation is very much an Anglo-Saxon kind of idea. It's not mm -hmm. happening in Germany. You're saying that's the same experience you see in Belgium, Dorothy. Basically, yeah. people aren't resigning in en masse. Um, but they're thinking about it. They're more open to opportunity and exploring it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, call, I call them passive passive candidates. They're, they're they're the people who are in jobs that um sources are targeting. And at one time, you might have to be quite persistent or persuasive. And it's just okay. Yeah, when do you want to talk to me? Yeah, so, and and that makes sense actually. I mean, right now, if there's ever a moment to to explore other opportunities, it might it has to be now. I mean, this is when you can get better com conditions, you get better opportunities, you get them coming to you. If you're a candidate or you're a person that is you know motivated by career progression, let's say, 
now is the time to actually start those conversations, even if you end up not going in any place, because you can extract some better value from uh, from the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's definitely out there, um, but not as polarized, I'd say, as in the UK and the US, where you've got quite significant numbers. But, you know, uh, people are open. What about the uh, talking about job discovery and job search, Dorothy? I know you do a lot of advice to senior level people who are investigating markets or trying to have these conversations. Do you think there's any been any major changes in terms of how uh, the job seeker behavior has happened in 2021? That's worth uh, remarking on. What for for recruiters? Uh, well, for I, candidates, I would uh, say. For candidates. Well, I, I think. Um, one of one of the frustrations of candidates is they don't feel that they're, they're being treated with correctly, which is why the candidate value proposition resonated um, so much. But I think I think for um, for senior people that the job search is a is a component of four pieces. So it's the the art, which is telling a compelling story. The science is making sure that you're optimized and searchable. And then you've got the push marketing, which is everything you do yourself. And then you've got pull marketing, which is driving traffic to, to you. And that's something with COVID, whereas this is a demographic that would be out lunching and networking and doing all this sort of stuff, that they're doing much less of that now. And, you know, they don't like to be on LinkedIn with polls and God knows what. They can't be bothered with that. They don't have the time. So it, it's about making letting them letting people know discreetly that they're on the market yeah being visible i've got a friend of mine who you know i don't think he's that old he's similar age to me but he's got i would say a baby a baby uh, hardly hardly um but he he's got a i would say a super comfort conservative way of discover of job discovery right which i think doesn't work for him uh right now uh because it's for him previously it was all about yeah i'm gonna apply for these jobs um and uh, and, and that would be that would be all there and i'm saying to him you know what you can do that but you're in such a niche that whatever job you're applying for there's actually going to be a quite a low volume of these jobs um and whenever they appear they're so attractive that you're actually going to be in a, a weird competition which is against what the market conditions are like elsewhere uh, you're going to just be you have to be really really close to the market to even get anywhere and i'm trying to coach him to say what you've got to do is just be more visible like i don't see you anywhere um, so if I'm not seeing you anywhere and I'm connected to every recruiter on the planet, uh, if I'm not seeing you, I can guarantee you other recruiters are not seeing you either. Um, so you're totally dependent on, as you say, push, right? Totally dependent on this. Like uh, that is just one lever you can push. And that's the only thing you're, you're doing. Uh, what you need is to get some inbound. Uh, and that's that's doing more public commentary. That's doing uh, just be more visible, interact with a few more people in a way which uh, is, is observable by others. Um, you know, networking um, in the, the lunching, schmoozing stuff that kind of we used to do. Maybe we don't ever do that anymore with COVID, right? Uh, big yeah, change of behavior. I we get that back. I would hope we get that back. Certainly living in Belgium, I'd love to get that back as well. Uh, great food over there. But like there's ways in which you could smooth like online that you should all you should kind of build into your game because right now you can't just say oh wait for the lunches to come back there's other stuff you can do in the meantime so really interesting i mean is, is doing it, it doing it online is surely considerably more effective than doing it offline because you get your 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 skills and abilities and potential to vastly more people if you get your message right don't you well, it's, I mean, in an ideal world, it would be a mix of both um, because quite often, I mean, at one time, the um, online networking and external networking or in-person in networking were two quite separate categories and they were and they were viewed quite independently. But now I think they're so overlapping. Um, so if you were heavily reliant on in-person networking, I mean, it doesn't matter if you've got a small network, if they all work for you and it works. It do, I mean, I know CEOs, they know 10 people and they're all, you know, get them into jobs, that's fine. But that that's very rare. So I would encourage, you know, senior, well, anybody, not just senior people, to, to really raise their visibility, start networking, interacting with people, um, but in a way that feels comfortable and authentic. And very yeah. often you can transfer that um, from online to in, in person. Oh, I hear little. Oh, sorry. I was say, That's no, okay. No. I did apologize. You've got a, a, a baby, a small child. 
Don't, don't put her on mute, man. If you need to do some, there's a very no. There's a very very thick door between me and her. She's just really really. She's just banging right on now. the door. That's so cute. It's, okay, if you need to, if you need to take no, she's care. she's not. She's uh, just out there crying about something. I don't know. She's That's with somebody saying. else. Sorry, <laughs> like maybe maybe no, you need to do no, some. Other people are with her. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Fine. Um, uh, Dorothy, uh, I don't just noticed that we're flying through this. Um, what's your like one thing you would you would like people to do in 2022 that maybe they're not doing so much. In in 2021 yeah the reaching out i i mean i i think that one of the thing i mean and you would adam you were talking about the benefits of covid i mean if the you know it feels terrible to say this but we have such a great reason to to reach out to people and this is this is my mission for next year is to you know make contact with people everybody's got something going on right and it's really important to reach out, express gratitude, show appreciation, and and just try and network in a very positive and and less transactional way. That's yeah. what I'm, my goal for next year. That's amazing. You know, that's an inspiration, Dorothy, to just go into any interaction with a plus one mentality. Like, can I just like leave that interaction having given a plus to somebody something? And uh, no matter how big or small that plus is, that's all you need to do. That and there's there's almost like a karmic reward to that, I find. Um, because the more negativity you put out there in the world, the, guess what? The more negativity comes back at you. Um, and the more positivity you put out there, the more positivity comes back at you. Um, and I think, you know, for people who might be struggling, I think that's maybe something to experiment with. Just give that a shot and see what's what. Um, okay. Can I just, there's a television show called New Amsterdam. I don't know if, do you get that in the UK? Um, we do. And um, their, their key line is, how can I help you? And and I think that is a, is a great, um, rather than what can you do for me, but how can I help you should be the, the go-to phrase for next year. It's just to inspire me. Maybe we should do a, like a, a, a brain food thing on this. Like, is there a way in which we could, you know, like just intentionally do something positive and have a, some sort of event that's related to that? Um, but maybe that's a, that's a, a, an idea that needs to percolate a little bit more. Um, OK, Dorothy, listen, um, great to have you on the show. Thank you so Thank much you. for your patience today. Um, a very have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Thank New Year. You. Um, and we'll be in touch online, obviously, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet up if uh, you know all things considered, um, uh, things go well. Um, you know, well overdue a visit to uh, to to, be to Belgium um, in 2022. So, um, so yeah, take you. yeah, take care of yourself, Dorothy. And my plug for my newsletter it's called Future um, Future Perfect. Um, work and careers. I can't even remember the name. But if you connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll see it's all on my profile. Share your LinkedIn profile in the chat there, Dorothy. Um, uh, great to see you and we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye, everyone. Happy Christmas. You too. Great. Uh, okay, we're running super late, um, but I'm going to try and bring on Nico for the final the final kind of, let's have the verdict on what where, where HR tech is going. Um, and in fact, you know, this is, this is where in fact, all three of us have had experience of building HR tech. So we should just have a quick five, 10 minutes on this uh, to see what is hot trot. Um, uh, you know, um, there he is. Good Lord. Nico, you're in the office working hard, working hard, mate. Bonjour, bonjour. Actually, I was watching Arsenal, but uh, yeah, yeah, working hard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Good to see you, man. Um, and oh, oh, I mean, I think most people know who you are, but let's let's make sure of that. Uh, can you quickly introduce yourself, who you are, what it is you do? Yeah, Nico Blier Silvestri. I am French living in Denmark. Uh, I've been in recruitment and HR for like 15 plus years. Uh, that's the sentence earlier on, the, like, yeah, 2005, 15 years ago. It hit so hard when I heard this one, but that's. Uh, you know, that's the truth. And I am the co-founder and uh, yeah, co-founder of Platypus, Platypus de Tayo. Lucky enough, uh, Heidi mentioned us uh, early on. She's too kind. Uh, Platypus de Tayo, HR Tech. Yeah, fantastic. And, and Nico... Can you, Nico, could, sorry, could you just give us your full name, by the way? Because I think Nico's <laughs> actually, he's actually related to Louis the Fourteenth or something. Do it. Do the full name. Nicolas Alain Michel Julien Blier Silvestri. 
dear, oh dear. It's, it's, it's kind of magnificent. You have to say it is, uh, it is kind of magnificent. A, a certain je ne sais quoi to uh, to this name, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, uh, the your naming systems are really interesting. Um, because I think the Brits are quite boring now because obviously it's been mixed with different languages and stuff. But um, I think the French often use a, a French aristocracy actually use a lot of their long names to describe like castles they own and stuff like this. Um, yeah. which the, is the, the, the blue blood, the aristocracy, yeah, they have long names. Uh, in my specific uh, case, uh, I don't think it's uh, every French name is that long. In my specific case, my parent gave me uh, my name, Nicolas, and then I'm carrying as well the name of my two grandfather and my godfather. Yeah, yeah but yeah. what about you've got de Versailles at the end of that, have you as well? <laughs> no, I don't have de Versailles <laughs> because I am from De Ici les Molinos, so it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, anyway, uh, Nico, uh, uh, we, we, the reason why I wanted to have you on the show is to talk about this, the state of HR tech. Um, you know, uh, all three of us now uh, have had some experience of building HR tech products of varying levels of like ex uh, sort of experience and success. Um, but this year, 2021, has been like a record breaking year, hasn't it, for HR tech investments? So in other words, loads of money, VC money's flooded into HR tech. People are, are parking their cash in this space. Um, and it seems like this is a really exciting place to build technology. Um, where do you think um, sort of where do you think the adoption level is for uh, companies that are looking at HR tech these days? Like what is mandatory? What is not mandatory? What needs to kind of move into the mandatory space that isn't there yet? Um, any thoughts on this? So first thing first, I don't think it's only HR tech. I think the, the investment market is absolutely insane. Uh, you see some rounds that are like just in terms of numbers uh, uh, crazy, and that's because they're dry eyes. There's too much money on the market. They need to invest somewhere, number one. I think it's still very good that we see a lot more investment in HR tech because in my experience, and I think Adam can uh, concur, uh, HR tech has always been the poor parent of, uh, of VCs because they're like, oh, that's uh, it's HR, it's yeah. risky, right? Unless you can prove like a immediate ROI within the first six to 12 months, they're like, I say it's it's uh, it's risky. The good thing is, I think, uh, or my experience, and and I don't know if Adam, if if you agree, is that this mindset is changing. It's not risky anymore. It's shit. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, employees, uh, people are what make company work. So how about we invest money on those uh, HR tech that are helping those, finding those people, hiring those people, or retaining those people? Um, and we've seen this with a lot of big rounds in uh, in lots of. Uh, um, Attractive organization, Personio, uh, did uh, did very well again uh, this year, right? Uh, just to name them, but uh, but uh, there's a lot of smaller organizations that are coming up. Uh, it's good. It means as well that the market is packed. I mean, there's so many solutions, right? And and uh, we're not we're looking at the broad uh, HR uh, uh, spectrum, right? There's a lot of solutions in uh, in sourcing. There's a lot of solutions in uh, in recruitment. There's still ATSs coming out. I mean, I still wonder how and why there's still ATSs coming out, to be honest with you. But they're still new. And and if you listen to any HR tech, they're going to tell you, yeah, but we're different. Um, and uh, yeah, Adam, go fight. Now, I can add a couple of things to that as well, which are that if you look at the um, evolution of the VC world, the first thing they looked at was finance, fintech, because it's the oldest business discipline that there is. And then the next thing they looked at was sales technologies and MarTech, because again, it's like, you know, pretty, pretty traditional sort of ways of doing things. So right for disruption, much, much more mature and right for disruption. I mean, we're now at the point where most companies have actually got people in HR or like a people function or whatever you, you call it, but it's a much less mature profession. And therefore it's had... Um, a lot, a lot less necessity to really change until now. So it's play, just playing catch up. HR yeah. as a discipline is just really playing catch up. So I agree with Nico. There's a lot of money going into most areas, but I think slightly, slightly, slightly more into HR tech just now because it is so much further behind than most other business disciplines. And as well, uh, HR is changing super. F I mean, it's it's been changing yeah. so much over the last 10, 15 years, right? Yeah. It's uh, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the good old. Uh, it's becoming a numbers game, as in like uh, it's not how many candidates you reach out or whatever. It's becoming a data game, and we didn't have tools and technology yeah. uh, for data in HR in the past, and now it's coming. Uh, now the 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 switch mm -hmm. is more. Now that we get the technology uh, to get access to the right data and so on, uh, it's actually probably going to have to retrain most of uh, us uh, working in HR because most of us working in HR are not data trained. 
uh, we're not trained to understand data, use data, and so on. Um, so in a way, potentially, technology is going faster than the skills of the people using that technology within most organizations. Okay, that's a really interesting point, Nico. Let's sit on that for a little while. Um, the technology is changing the work of HR, and mm -hmm. HR skills have got to got to step up to the task. What skills do HR or TA need to de develop in 2022 in order for them to be uh, competent with this new technological environment? Um, my obvious one is data analysis. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying you become a data scientist. That is a specific job with specific skills, but some training on data analysis, Six Sigma understanding, this kind of stuff, uh, that, that will make a world of difference because you were in, in a part of uh, work, unless you were working in Comp and Ben, you were, you were in a part of the organization that was really not data driven. That was very much like a, a emotionally relationship driven. And, uh, and, and now it's completely switched. I mean, there's data everywhere. You cannot do recruitment today without having some, some, some data driven data on, on reporting and, and so on, right? Um, and if you don't understand your data, you're basically not going to be as efficient as you could be in your recruitment process. And it's all about efficiency now in, in, in recruitment, right? So, um, And one way, one, one way we can see this um, materializing is with the growth of jobs like HR operations and or TA operations. And these jobs are basically robot managers. That's what yeah. they are. They're basically tech managers, right? So, you know, there, 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 are, there are certainly going to be in, in big recruitment teams, um, you, you can see that there's there's less and less people actually filling jobs, and mm -hmm. there's more and more people looking at process and technology and uh, you know other other things that really humans need analytical skills to be able to do. So there's two big, examples, big like very strong per, um, like example, like uh, how HR is becoming like more you know operations. There's Jess from Whereby that went from like a, a leading HR into like CEO, Chief Operation Officer, and that's because she has the mindset of data and the way she looks at HR and everything. And just recently, I think I read about it yesterday, the new uh, CEO of Chanel uh, yeah. in France, exactly. Yeah, Voila, uh, coming from a chief people officer. And we're going to see more of those, but we'll only see those if you train and understand data within HR. Then, yeah, then if you understand and, and can manage data within HR, you're basically the most powerful person in the room because who's making money of your organization? You can have the best tool if you want. People are making organizations. And, and I, I'm super happy to see this, actually. Yeah, this is actually really positive. I saw both of those examples. Um, but it's always been one of the case that anybody working in HR has never been the C the CEO. Never happened. Um, but we're now moving into a place where the work is changing, the valuation of workers is is, is elevated in the in the mindset of businesses. And and if we get our kind of act together. Uh, and, and fill in those skills gaps, we actually are in a very strong position going forward. Mm. Um, so the chance of us us being, you know, the, the HR, a group of people, um, to improve, if you like, um, the status of our work, I think is really, really there. But as you say, data analysis, uh, data literacy is one of the key components of this. Um, let's stick with this idea for a little while. Adam, bring you into this. What are the skills do you think is missing from HR and, and TA people generally that you know, we really want to see them build in 2022. I mean, I, my immediate instinct is that Nico's entirely correct. It's around data and analysis of data. However, I, I'm going to answer the question in a slightly different way, which is there is an over there is an overstock of 360 degree recruiters in um, in in talent acquisition and. So I'm going to I'm going to say something that's like the opposite of what you just what you just asked. The, those jobs for a 360 degree recruiter are are becoming more rare um, as employers are realizing that the difference between sourcing and assessment is vast. One person is not going to be amazing at both of those things. The you know a great sourcer has got a sp specific skill set. Somebody that's really good at um, assessment is going to have a you know a different type of skill set. So I think what that means is the growth of specialties within recruitment of all sorts, 
specialties is the I, thing that I, is I agree with that, but it's also dependent a little bit on scale, isn't it? Because if you're a small business or yeah, you're sure. one, you know, you're going to have to do everything. Um, but I agree after a certain, after a certain period of time, the idea of stocking a hundred 360 recruiters in a, in a department, no. that's not happening. No, uh, no. The, the old HR business model or the H recruiter business model where recruit partner, where the partner is a 360 person to a department, probably that's going to go away. It's um, ineffective. Yeah, it's going to be more centralized. It's going to be specialized. It's going to hyper be... specialization and personalization. Yeah, yeah, it'll be like an in, almost like a mini business within the business uh, to provide that's what, the services. Uh, Heidi was saying, right? You build your like in-house LPO. Yep, yep, that's it. That's it. Exactly that. Yeah, um, I agree. In fact, if if even if we asked Heidi about her, she's got a team of five people. I imagine those five people are not three hundred and sixty degree to, degree recruiters. They'll be focused on specific. Um, parts of it. I'm not sure. I think five is too small. Five may be like regional or departmental focused. Maybe you get to 2030. That's when you start finding recruitment yeah, ops how many, people. How many organizations? Um, I mean, here you're talking enterprise, right? I mean, not every company like, and Vivino is not a small company. I mean, uh, they're 350, I think. Uh, uh, five recruiters is already a fair amount. To, in order to get an organization that has 20, 30 full-time working uh, uh Recruiters, you're looking at a, what a company of thousand people at least, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an, it's right. We need to have that uh, segmentation in terms of what is the ideal structure for a TA team based on company size. Maybe that's a, a bring food live for um for for next year. Um, okay, folks, listen. I just noticed the time we're like well over, and I want to make sure that this is a downloadable video because I think there's a limit to how how big a video might be uh as it reminds me i think this is the longest show we've done this year we're going to actually do a the first show uh for brain food live in january is going to be a market 2022 pre predictions i think i've already got george larock to join us for that um i'm hoping to get some analytical like uh, industry analytical types as well uh that can help sort of, sort of say okay in this year 2022 we're going to see these things happen um, and, and they might be, maybe, uh, Neil or someone like that can come back for this as well. That would be quite an exciting one to do. Um, okay. That's about it. Um, let's say, uh, uh, let's end the show there. Nico, great to see you, sir. Um, I hope you have a very good day. Uh, have a very Merry Christmas. Of one last thing. I'll just hung, I'll just uh, hijack this for one second. Uh, go ahead. Heidi mentioned, uh, you know, what to spend money on in 2022. And she was kind enough to mention platypus because we've, you know, he's using platypus. I have to be a salesperson like a uh, good old Adam. <laughs> when sometimes you have to pitch your uh, own product platypus, um, I'll put the link here in the up in the in the channel platypus is free in 2022 for any organization they on board full, fully free on platypus connect and platypus platform if you want some info reach out yes you heard it's free what do you full mean access fully free? to the organization free free like free like i love people it's christmas free it's free in all 22. right listen i don't understand that at uh, this <laughs> maybe the the end of uh, the end of Nico's business. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about making business you remember what, what did give you say earlier? how can i help you it's a big it's, giveaway. It's about how can I help you? But if, if if you're interested in this, I would totally recommend you give this a shot because it looks like you've got a, a, a limited offer on this. Um, so do check it out. Uh, but Nico, thank you so much for your generosity there, man. Um, <laughs> Anytime. That's what I let's do. Let's keep in touch. Uh, I'll feature it on uh, this week in recruiting for next week as the offer as well. There's no reason thank why you. I couldn't do that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you have a good Christmas and uh, we'll speak again soon, man. Ciao. He's a great dude, Math. Sorry we lost his video. He's always quite animated as a as a guest, like his facial That's expressions. Probably why the internet can cope with his <laughs> Frenchness. <laughs> he is like ridiculously French. Uh, I wonder whether we should do that. Just uh, only get stereotypical national stereotypes on. Um, you know, if if you're not like a professional uh, a Scotsman, you can't actually turn up onto the show. Um, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. All right, listen. That's if about you're it. A mild, a mild Scotsman, like yeah. like Neil. You gotta have a sporran or some stuff, you know. Where's your where's your skin do? Um, right, uh, that's it. Um, thank you so much for watching Brain Food Live all of this year. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Actually, this two hours is just reminding me like how the hell did we ever do the 20 the 24 hour marathon? That was like the hardest thing ever. Um, uh, but uh, but yes, thanks for uh, bearing with us today. Um, have a very good Christmas. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, we will see you on the show 7th of January. That's the next show. So no two, sh we have two week break.
um, Christmas, New Year. We're not doing it. Uh, we're going to do come back in the seventh uh, of January. Uh, so we'll see you then. Have a very good and happy Christmas and happy New Year. Stay safe, everybody. Cool. All right, Adam. That's it. Um, uh, I thought that was a pretty good show. Um, really quite tiring <laughs> because of how long it was. I think I'm getting old. Usually, I'd be able to knock out a two-hour show, no problem. But um, but yeah, that was tough. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm wanna... desperate. I'm desperate to go to the toilet. So uh, just to, all right, just to, just to finish now. All right, listen. Just want to say thanks for all your support this year, man. Because no problem. Um, Thank you for having me. It's a two way street, mate. No, absolutely. It's been great for having you on the show. And if you're up for 2022, we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep rolling forward, mate. I'd love to. All right, listen. By the way, you don't have to. If you can also say, you know what, I can't be asshole. I'm not doing it, and then <laughs> that, that, that's all right as well. No, no, I, absolutely, 100%. I know that. Uh, All right. And if I didn't want it, I would say I don't want it. Cool. All right. We'll speak before Christmas anyway, but I'll, yeah. I'll see you soon. Go take a piss. See you, mate. Bye. All right.